first uh, session of uh, the international cardiology session for past 2021 so this is a panel discussion and we'll be talking about the impact of covid-19 on international cardiology we all know that this is public enemy number one right now and we have with us a distinguished panel of experts who represent prestigious cardiology institutes throughout the country uh, let me go ahead and introduce them dr bashir hanif is medical and executive director of taba heart institute Dr. Saqib Shafi Sheikh is Professor and Chief Executive Officer, Punjab Institute of, Institute of Cardiology. Dr. Hamid Sharif is Consultant Cardiologist, Rawal Pindi Institute of Cardiology. Major General Farhan Tayyab Sitara Emtiaz is Commandment and Chief Executive Officer, Director, Armed Forces Institute of Cardiology and, and National Institute of Heart Diseases. Major General Retired uh, Dr. Azhar Kayani is the former executive director of Rawal Pindi Institute of Cardiology and Armed Forces Institute of Cardiology. And last but not the least, Dr. Amber Malik, representing the females in this field, uh, is professor and consultant interventional cardiologist at Evercare Hospital Lahore, former HOD, Zeshik Zed Hospital Lahore. So let me just uh, start by posing a question to Dr. Bashir Hanif. And obviously I would request the other panelists to chime in um, if they need to make a comment. And the question is, what do you feel has been the impact of COVID-19 on Catalog STEMI volumes? I think uh, in the beginning, it was really drastic. There was significant decrease. And it was not in uh, our lab or in Pakistan, but it was probably all over the world. Uh, the cath, obviously elective cath, those were not being done. Only, em only emergency caths were being done. And it was true in uh, our lab as well. Although I was uh, not here at that time, the first wave I was in the US. But we stopped doing any elective cases and we were doing only uh, emergency cases. In the beginning, there was so scare that even uh, emergency cases, there was a lot of reluctance from the staff and uh, from, from the, even the physicians. Uh, but we had to do it. And uh, surprisingly, the volumes were very low. Uh, I think uh, uh, there has been a lot of um, uh, theories why it happened. But uh, really, it was amazing how significantly even uh, the volumes for primary PCI and emergencies went down. And again, I think uh, the numbers that were being quoted that were all over the world was around like almost 40% uh, uh, as compared to the uh, volumes before that. And the uh, same was true in our lab also. Uh, but after the first wave uh, uh, of COVID, uh, Luckily, decreased in Pakistan. We started uh, doing elective cases also. And uh, during the second wave, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, no one really changed the strategy. And we continue to do uh, the emergency as well as uh, uh, the elective procedures. And uh, in the beginning, the numbers were on the lower side. But uh, I would say over the last uh, couple of months, the numbers has been picking up. And uh, again, it's really very, very surprising that how the primary PCI volumes has, uh, again, even during the second wave, um, the numbers uh, uh, increased to the same as we used to have before COVID. So it's it's really amazing. But I think in, in our lab, I would say over the last uh, uh, couple of months, uh, the numbers has been more or less same as we used to have uh, before COVID. And we are doing uh, emergency and elective cases. We have a reserved one lab for emergency cases in which obviously we don't wait uh, to have those uh, the COVID testing, but for all elective cases, they have to have a COVID test. So in emergency, we take all the uh, precautions and uh, we do all those cases in that particular lab, but elective cases are being done after COVID. If anyone is positive, we are not going, we are not doing those uh, elective cases as well. So you've kind of partially answered my second question as well. <laughs> So maybe Dr. Uh, Major General Farhan Tayyab can comment on what his institute is doing with regards to the protocols to protect cath lab staff and patients because there is there was a significant stigma when this pandemic started. Uh, Dr. Farhan Tayyab? He was there. Drop the mic off. Run your mic. I think it's okay now. Yeah, you can hear you. Uh, so uh, I think uh, as Bashir Hanif has um, uh, told us, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first week, the volumes were greatly affected. And in fact, doctors as well as the staff were totally scared of uh, corona patients. And uh, we uh, procured all kind of uh, PPE and we, uh, we were kind of managing with level three uh, PPE. 
Uh, but then uh, slowly gradually i think the fear has uh, uh, gone a little bit i i would say it's not totally disappeared but uh, we have now realized that if we wear uh, these uh, n95 mask and uh, then we can do cases in our lab the, these days we we kind of have six labs with us uh, which are functioning at the moment we have reserved two labs for corona patient that that means for the primary pcr patients all primary pcr patients we uh, take them on we uh, do them we have, actually we have to decide that are they stable or unstable we do not you know do primary pci in the critically ill patients or otherwise the stable patients we take them to the lab and take all these precautions pp3 level 3 and uh, we do them and after the case is done we close the lab for 4 hours and we fumigate everything and after 4 hours they, that lab can be used again and as we said as i told you earlier we have two labs and if there is a primary pci in the same time we use the other lab and if we have uh, three uh, patients coming in with the pci then uh, the, the operator there decides if the third one has to receive streptokinase or uh, he has to wait that's what we are working but uh, i would say the scare has reduced a little bit uh, people are more willing to take on these patients and give them the treatment they need uh, with of course the, the the precautions as i have elaborated earlier you mentioned sir that uh, the more sicker patients uh, there was a reluctance to take them to the cath lab for a primary yeah, piece because if there is a suspicion there is a history of fever or cough or they have evidence of left ventricular failure there is always a chance that these patients are likely to be more likely to be corona positive and if these patients end up having a, like a cpr then the whole lab is exposed uh, you know once there, there, there is emergency the protocols are generally broken you know people forget and try and save the patient so we have you know decided that those critically ill patients we will we'll take them i uh, will give them streptokinase and the stable patients are straight away taken to the lab but the final decision uh, to patient to take the patient to the cath lab is of the operator he is the, the, the consultant on call he actually comes and decides thank you for encapsulating a very difficult situation and i agree that difficult decisions are required but amber you know i'm you you do know that i'm going to ask you the gender, the gender question so i would like to ask you what do you think is the differential effect of this pandemic on the way men versus women have presented or been managed do you have any comments for that or any insight i would just uh, i'll uh, comment again on the fact that on the first wave everybody uh, uh, was really really scared and the numbers dropped so dramatically and i'm i am not in a cardiac institute so you see uh, my center was uh, uh, is a is a is a cardiology department in a multi modality hospital so everything just vanished in that hospital you know the er's the, um, uh, uh, there were no patients coming in doctors were scared and uh, uh, everybody you didn't know what pp to wear where to get the pp cath labs uh, uh, our cath lab was not doing anything because there weren't any patients really and then mm -hmm. once the first wave went away half the doctors and nurses got infected as well got better uh, then uh, basically that's what happened the fear went away and in this second wave it has become business as usual and what we see is the same proportion of patients really uh, which is like uh, which is about 30% if you see you know the, the amount of intervention that you do in women versus men is usually around that figure 30 to 30% maybe or 40% uh, not ever more than that sometimes you would have months in which you may have a little bit more but otherwise uh, <clears throat> we have some figures that we may well uh, come up with eventually in our crop registry which has all the uh, which has uh, a lot of data coming in into it from different institutions so whenever they give us permission and put it together that would be a nice way of presenting what's happening all over the country particularly in the last one year uh, uh, with uh, gender uh, differences but uh, it has been an interesting year in that sense uh, uh, with the waves uh, coming in and with uh, uh, now we as uh, as dr farhan said we wear uh, uh, an n95 uh, uh, a face shield i always wear a face shield and uh, and and basically the blue gown that we used to we didn't we don't do all that level and again if we take in a primary we expect that it is covid positive and behave accordingly otherwise for elective cases we actually test everybody for covid you are right dr amber uh, last year has certainly been a, been a sentinel year and human nature turned out to be more resilient than we thought uh, dr sakib shakri uh, would you comment on the differential uh, volumes uh, of stemi versus non stacs 
has your uh, experience been surprising or interesting? Dr. Sakib Shafi. Uh, sir, you're on mute. Can hear me now. So we can't hear you. I, I, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'm getting all of my IT people. Can you hear me now? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, as, as uh, Dr. Farhan told, uh, our cases went down drastically in the, in the first wave. And that was more due to scare on the part of the patients rather than doctors. Uh, they were all there with all PPEs on and everything. We dedicated one lab totally to the COVID positive patients if they needed to be intervened. And after every such suspected or proven patient, we shut down the lab for four, six, or four hours and sort of uh, uh, sterilize it and everything and kept on going our cases. But due to all the public transport uh, restriction and everything, the number came down drastically. But in this second wave, as everybody agrees, probably uh, the doctors and patients are both confident, uh, better treatment modalities are there, and uh, we are strictly following the, at the Gavishu of Kairali, the public, SOPs for spread of COVID, everybody's supposed to be in masks all the time, like I am still in the mask that came out of the gas lab. And uh, all the PPEs are given to the emergency staff and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I, I'll bring, I'll sort of, I, I'd like to bring the whole panel to another aspect of uh, this COVID uh, pandemic more related party to clinical and other things. And that's, I think that the, the clinical research has taken really a big, uh, big uh, land with this COVID. For example, uh, we and uh, uh, the Institute of Cardiology uh, and uh, NICBD were supposed to be part of a, a shorter rule and we create a study from uh, sponsored by China and things like that, but that never uh, took off at least up till now due to all this COVID pandemic. So I think more than clinical services, which kept on going on, for example, in, in this second wave, we are doing almost 40 to 50 interventions per day, a timely, non-timely, rich, poor, men, women, whatever you want to say. But uh, the, uh, what has really gone on the back step is the clinical research along with this, uh, somehow or other, the clinical work picking up, the research work uh, related to all these things is not coming back on track. I don't know, it's an inertia for doing the research or some other factor or whatever it is. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Sakib. You're right, uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 has required all hands on deck and, and clinical work has taken precedence. You are absolutely right. But we hope that this year will be a little better for us and we can breathe a lot easier. Major General Azhar Kayani, uh, what is, uh, I'm sure that you have a long history or we, you, we know that you have a long history of training cardiology residents and international fellows. And so uh, during this pandemic, what do you think has been the impact on their training? Yeah, assalamualaikum everyone. Hello everyone. Uh, yeah, um, I think the impact of training has been everyone was scared, uh, including the PGs and the trainers as well. So most of the time, I think once uh, one of your staff, or doctors, or nurses, or paramedical staff, they got infected, so that scared everyone. And at the same time, I think the first wave, as everyone um, shared, that uh, a patient number of patient volume has suddenly, I think, dramatically. Uh, gone down. But now this second wave, I think there's no such thing. Most of the patients, they are coming and the uh, very positive uh, doctors and paramedical staff uh, wearing proper PPEs and doing all the kind of procedure 
again, I think for elective procedures, you have to see whether the core positive or negative. But I think the training certainly has suffered because the, still the trainees, they are very, very, very scary. Because I, I, I know that a uh, few of our colleagues, they got infected and it was a good number, four to five numbers. And once they got infected, then they, they, everyone was very, very careful. Uh, thing is that uh, you uh, do all kinds of procedures. Uh, this uh, second wave has been scary uh, for us as well because most of our, our colleagues of my age or slightly younger than me or other, especially from the medical profession uh, in the army and in civil, they got infected and they are admitted in the hospital. And uh, this has, I think, hit them mostly the professionals and the senior professionals and the young professionals as well. And uh, there have been a few mortalities as well. And that is very scary. And uh, so far, I think we have been very, very lucky. Uh, maybe I think we are waiting for our turn and uh, hope that everyone stays safe. But still, I think the thing is very, very scary. But the second wave hasn't uh, affected uh, the volume at all. And most of the patients, they are coming. But Another important thing is the people are coming to you in the hospitals with the post-COVID status and where they are, they are they recovered, but still they're having symptoms. They've got weakness. They've got chest pain, shortness of breath. They've got ECG changes. And then suddenly you come to know after three or four days, suddenly died. And uh, this is uh, post-COVID kind of things, a thrombogenic side of thing, and they become more thrombotic and maybe a stroke, but mostly the patient, they certainly, but uh, the patient I know, though have been coming to my clinic and to my hospital. Uh, they have been having uh, this uh, post-COVID complications and mostly the fatal complications. That's a very scary thing. Uh, I think most of the time, I think you have to put them uh, on uh, antiplatelets and then at the same time, they were exoban and uh, you keep monitoring them. And if they complain of something, some symptom, you have to take them very seriously and put them in the coronary care unit and monitor them and treat them accordingly. But uh, certainly I've come to know that, that this uh, post-COVID patient, they are mostly having a, a, a mortality which should be, I think, prevented at all costs. And uh, all those patients who are coming to us in the hospital or uh, in our clinics, I think we should uh, go for their uh, COVID testing. Uh, plus, at the same time, go for the CRP and D-dimers. And once those are disturbed, then you treat them accordingly. But uh, um, um, I think so for anyone who is COVID positive and come with a primary PCI. Uh, initially, uh, when I was working in uh, uh, RIC, uh, then uh, I retired in April last year. At that time, uh, I think this volume was dropped down. But but uh, I think we were doing routinely all the primary, PC, uh, primary PCIs. And especially if the clinically, we thought that they are not having uh, any symptoms of COVID and they were tested. In those days, the test used to take 48 to 72 hours. And then, then there was no point in waiting for that period. You used to take them into the cath lab and uh, do the primary PCI. But now the things are totally different. We, we are a little bold now. And then maybe... Uh, uh, I normally don't wear a shield in the cath lab. I just put on the N95 and put on gowns and gloves and everything. But shield, I think, a shield, somehow or the other, I think, obscures and then uh, the, the, your vision and you can't uh, see the vessel clearly. You can't see your, uh, your devices clearly. So I, 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 I'm fine. I put on the glasses uh, for that matter and that, that should be fine. But at the same time, I think uh, because you you uh, um, can't see the things clearly on the screen. So uh, we have got uh, so far touch wood. I think uh, we are okay. But this is how it is going. But the, this thing is still there. And suddenly the number has dropped down now. And the wave is, I think, dying down. You never know when the third wave will come. But I think we should wait for that. Because now I see uh, people of my age and my even senior to me. They are admitted already admitted my I, they, they, from medical profession. They already admitted in the hospitals, and uh, people are suffering and they're getting infected. So we need to be very, very careful. Well, and on that note, I would request you to take very good care of yourself. We need you, so just be very careful about the PPE. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, pointing out some important research uh, questions that you have been from this pandemic. Dr. Hamid Sharif, uh, a question for you from Dr. Khawar Kazmi, actually, and he has asked you. He has asked us. Uh, how do you think COVID-19 has impacted the quality of patient care? Uh, so as a representative of RIC, I would first of all ask the permission of General Kiani if I'm able to uh, speak on behalf. Because uh, when the COVID was going on, so General Kiani was at the helm of affairs. So if he, if he this uh, permission, and then I can talk about Yeah, that. please, please go ahead. Please Thank go you ahead. very much. So uh, briefly, first of all, I would like to tell you about uh, Ralpin Institute of Cardiology. Uh, 
as most of you must be knowing, it is one of the only private, uh, sorry, public sector cardiology institute in the northern part of the country. And it caters for a lot of patients. A lot of patients come from the northern part, uh, including uh, the KP, uh, Gilgit Baltistan, uh, uh, the tribal areas, uh, northern Punjab, uh, Azad Kashmir. A lot of patients do come. And now I was just looking at uh, coming back home just to give you an insight. Now we are normally see approximately 15 to 2,000 patients in OPD on a daily basis. And this is what we are talking about, the second wave of COVID still ongoing. So this is about the volume of the cases uh, of the patients that we are getting in. And uh, another important thing that I think a lot of credit goes to Jim Kenny again, uh, uh, probably uh, as far as the 24 seven services of primary PC across the board, uh, regardless of the social economic status of the patient's concern, it is only second to NICBD in giving such services. So in the Northern part, we were the only uh, center giving 24 seven throughout the clock uh, services to patients coming with STEMIs. So definitely under the guidance of Jim Kenny, we sat together and we devised a plan how to uh, when the COVID was uh, was um, in the, during the first wave and the lockdown was uh, was uh, thought to be going going on, so we sat together and decided how to go about uh, treating such patients. So, uh, since we were uh, one of the one of the primary centers uh, giving uh, primary PCI care, so we thought that we will have to lead from the front and we have to benefit as much as patients possible. So, we sat together, we devised the plans that those patients who were COVID positive, either they had that PCI report or they had. I mean, uh, infiltrates on the x-rays, or they had um, the ground gag, grass opacity kind of thing on their, uh, on their uh, CT scan. So these are the patients coming in STEMIs within 12 hours, we lysed them. So we thought yeah. that, I mean, yes, getting the such patients to the cath lab would be very much riskier, exposing a lot of, uh, of paramedical staff, the doctors uh, to such patients. So such patients were quarantined, you can say, or were kept in a, in a kind of an isolation in the emergency. Uh, they were dedicated nurses and doctors who were equipped with PPEs who were looking after these patients, their vitals and all that, then they were lies. Now, those patients who were... Uh, uh, with that, may I request you to uh, finish your comment? Uh, okay, sorry. So, Dr. Pahim Jaffrey. Yes. Okay, so those patients who were um, uh, not uh, positive, so they were the ones who were taking the standards. So I've got the numbers, if you can allow me. So in our past, you can see as far as the decline in number is concerned. So the two months that we did, the STEMIs numbers came down, the primary PCI from 620 to 386. So it was approximately 40% decline. Uh, primary PCI reduced from 492 to 144. So normally in the last two, two months of the last year, we did around approximately 500 and it came down to 150 only. So it is 66%. So this is what the volume was. And lysis increased from 54 to approximately 102, so 50% increase. Thank you, so this, Thank you so for all your patient care. And we really appreciate what our Indian Institute of Cardinal is saying. But if Fahim Jaffrey, I would request you to take over now and proceed with the session. Thank you, Saira. And, uh, you know, so it's time to now talk about complex stuff. And uh, uh, I have my the pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Bilal Murad, who's going to be talking about treating complex calcified lesions. Uh, Bilal is, uh, of course, I've known Bilal forever. Uh, Bilal is a graduate of AKU uh, from the class of 1991. He was a valedictorian. Um, he completed his fellowship at the University of Minnesota and then interventional training at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And he's been in practice for over 20 years, um, mainly in the twin cities of uh, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, and incidentally, it's one of the coldest cities in the world. Um, he's currently director of uh, interventional cardiology, structural heart and cardiac uh, cath uh, at the cardiac cath lab uh, for Minneapolis Heart Institute in Minnesota. Um, his uh, key expertise is uh, essentially everything, uh, but the complex stuff, which includes high-risk PCI, uh, structural heart and coronary imaging. He is an international proctor for uh, CTO PCI, and uh, he expresses his passion for that by coming back home to Pakistan every year to train uh, younger interventionists. Um, Bilal uh, lives with his wife, Naheed, who is also an AQ alumnus from the class of 91 and his three lovely children. Um, he also uh, ha wears another hat, which is uh, that of being a sort of social activist, uh, working towards social justice. Um, he uh, has founded uh, and uh, is operating a couple of nonprofits in Minnesota which includes uh, Zaka, which is a local Zakat organization, and the Rama Clinic, which is the only free cardiology clinic in the U.S. for uninsured patients. So with that, uh, without further ado, Bilal, I look forward to your talk on treating complex calcified lesions. On to you, Bilal. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you so much. It's uh, such a privilege for me to be here today uh, with all of you. 
I wish it was in person. Um, as an AQ uh, graduate, I don't think it gets really better than this um, to be speaking uh, and be, be able to contribute towards a conference at AKU. So thank you for, for inviting me, Usman, and, and giving me this opportunity. Um, it's uh, about two degrees below uh, outside here in Minnesota, uh, and it's the middle of winter, so it's kind of a fun time to be here. So what I'd like to do today is to talk to you uh, uh, about uh, complex PCI. This is a view of, uh, of our beautiful Minnesota here um, with the snow, and despite all the snow in the winter, you can see the beautiful birds outside uh, always feeding, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a land of four seasons. My goal today is to talk to you a little bit about the prevalence and impact of coronary calcification on procedures and outcome, uh, very briefly, uh, the role that intracoronary imaging uh, plays in the diagnosis and management of complex PCI cases, the tools that we have currently for dealing with coronary calcification, and how do we apply those tools? So we go through some case reviews. And this area really brings together for me uh, this extremely important concept, at least in my mind, that the first intervention that we do to somebody is the single most important intervention because all future interventions will follow based on what we have done. So preparation of the lesion, imaging of the coronary arteries, applying coronary physiology, and optimizing the result is really, it's all, all, it's all about that, no matter whether it's a type A lesion or whether it's a type C lesion. And, and this concept sort of, you have to include this holistic approach towards looking at the clinical aspect of the patient, their risk factors, what makes them complex or not complex, uh, what is the anatomic characteristics uh, that you're seeing on the coronary angiography, studying that, taking the time to plan with it in your mind, um, uh, uh, talking it over with your team, uh, making sure that everybody in the team is involved and knows exactly what the plan is and how you're going to approach this complex lesion, uh, keeping in mind the LV function, the hemodynamics, uh, and what exactly is the patient going to be able to tolerate. You have to think about three or four steps down the road more than anybody else, thinking, if this vessel goes down, if this vessel has abrupt closure, if I have a coronary perforation, what is going to happen? How are we going to deal with that? And, and having that team approach is extremely important for a successful procedure. Now, coronary calcification is extremely common. Um, if, you, if you can see it on the angiogram, uh, even on a still frame, you already have severe coronary calcification. And this is an example of a patient that I just did this uh, a couple of weeks ago, in fact, where you can already see before the dye is injected, that essentially it's an E-shaped vessel with multiple lesions, bulky protuberant calcification. So coronary calcium is a very common thing to find. And if you look at the pool data from 13 um, drug loading stent trials, the average reported is about 30% when you talk about moderate to severe uh, coronary calcification. And actually I have seen some reports that are up to even 50%. And, and why does it matter so much? Because calcium impacts our outcome because it affects our ability to cause lesions. The, uh, the balloon doesn't expand adequately. Uh, when you do deploy a stent, the stent gets deformed, the drug elution is affected. Uh, there's calcium behind the, the stent struts that prevents it from being ad adequately opposed. When you apply super high pressures, this is what can happen when you have a coronary perforation despite um, uh, a stenting. And uh, you know, uh, this, gives me, this image gives me nightmares because in my 20 year career, I've had two people who died on the table with exactly this artery and this location. Um, and uh, two of the 10 people that I've lost in, in, my, in my career so far. And, um, uh, and of course, you know, uh, there is bias when you, with the different kind of devices that you're using depending on the nature of the calcification. So this results eventually in worse clinical outcome for the patient and more complications. And if you look at the complexity of the procedure that we're doing, as you can see over time, the red bar over here indicates the, the number of type C lesions that we are addressing, and that can be correlated with the increase in coronary calcification over the years. And this is important because, especially in, in our part of the world here in the United States and Western countries, the people are living longer and, and hopefully in, 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 in back home as well. And as they get older, there's more calcium. Uh, we've seen this obviously that CAD feels very premature in the population that we are in Pakistan particularly. And, and as we deal with TAVR or other complicated uh, issues, uh, coronary calcification becomes even more. So we're we sort of addressing this issue even more and more. So we have worse outcomes. This has been demonstrated in multiple clinical trials. And when you have severe or moderate calcification, your even your one-year ischemic outcomes uh, is more adverse. And this has been shown consistently in Horizon's trial. It has been shown by Dr. Sharma's uh, group at Mount Sinai. And there are multiple other registries that I'm not going to go into details over here right, right now. So how do we assess this by just not by just coronary angiography and eyeballing it? 
Because the mistake that I think that we make is we always have this approach that, well, it looks okay. It's not that bad. The reality is our eye continues to deceive us. And we have such beautiful imaging modalities now that uh, it really tells us what the story actually is. And this is an example of an OCT. The images are fantastic. You can see the intima, the media, the external elastic lamina, understand the vessel size and the, and the distribution in the longitudinal and cross-sectional abilities. There is even a three-dimensional ability. And, and with every frame, the, you can assess the micro, minimal luminal area of the vessel. And here, uh, depending on the distribution of, your, of the calcification here, you can see this is a concentric ring of calcium. The beauty of uh, our OCT is that it does not prevent you from assessing vessel size, unlike IVUS, where you just have a dark shadow. And the distribution, how many arcs are involved, will really help you determine what kind of approach should you take. Should you just take a cutting balloon, just take a non-compliant balloon because it's just uh, uh, you know one arc of calcification, or if it's a, a solid core of 360 degree arc of calcium, you really can get by with, cannot get by with just a balloon approach as well. So it helps us customize therapy for each individual patient. IVUS is also extremely helpful, especially high definition IVUS. But as you can see in this image over here, that once you have a, a dentring of calcium, you know what the treatment is. The difficulty here is that you just can't assess what's behind it. And so therefore, the resolution of OCT being 10 times more than that of IVUS, you can see so much more, but then what you lose with, uh, with IVUS, uh, with OCT is the depth because IVUS has great depth abilities. So uh, it's in the interest of time, let me just quickly skip over uh, some of these slides and show you here that what happens when you uh, adequately use a tool to uh, atherectomize uh, uh, a lesion, you can see it on high definition IVUS and OCT as fractures that you're creating inside the vessel wall. And that's what affects the lesion compliance, it affects your ability to, to expand the stent and give the best result to the patient. And, uh, and the more imaging you do, the more you begin to appreciate that. So what are the tools that we have currently? Yes, we've had non-compliant balloons. A cutting balloon uh, is really, uh, is a good tool to use when there's sort of mild to moderate degree of calcification or if it's a severe lesion where you really, you really cannot apply a, a atherectomy device because of, of tortuosity or it's too risky to do so. Um, but once you have that ability, then really it's important for anybody who is able to perform based on their local circumstances, uh, rotational or orbital atherectomy to really utilize those tools and get really comfortable with them because they're extremely valuable tools. Laser has much less of a role to play. It's a very expensive tool to have. You probably will not do more than you know, half a dozen cases in a year. But the thing about laser is that when you need laser, there's nothing else that will work for you except for that. Because when there are lesions that you cannot cross, and I will show you some case, a couple of cases like that too, uh, uh, where you cannot cross anything that will allow you to do an atherectomy or orbital atherectomy, laser is the only thing that might get you uh, uh, through that. So, uh, this slide didn't come up uh, appropriately, I apologize for that, but we have to sort of approach this in a very sort of a sophisticated way, assess the degree of calcification, um, uh, how are we going to look uh, at that, how do we image it, and then decide what your strategy is going to be. So the tools that we have currently available are rotational atherectomy, it's been around for 25 years. Um, um, everybody in the audience has sort of knows about that, I won't belabor the point too much here, except the fact that there's diamond chips that is at the at the distal end of the uh, of the burr, the back end of it is polished, so it's and it's a forward rotating uh, device, uh, it, unlike the orbital atherectomy device that spins in an orbital eclipse. Uh, eclipse. The data on the rotational atherectomy is really basically focused on: is it safe to do it, and is it effective to do it? It doesn't really give you too much about long-term outcomes, and that has been one of the deficiencies in the data when you look at atherectomy devices. The industry has been focused about promoting the use of the device. So most of the time we use it because it does improve the procedure and it improves procedure complications, but there is not a whole lot of data to prove that by doing so, you're gonna significantly impact long-term outcome in terms of you know, uh, 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 mortality. But there's no question there's value into it. Um, orbital atherectomy, the diamond bank device by CSI, and I happen to live in the, what's called the Mecca of medical device industry, which is the Minneapolis and Paul area. So the uh, headquarters of all these major companies is right here. So we have that luxury of being able to to see all this uh, at close hand, but this is essentially a crown, which is on an elliptical mound. And then it, when it spins, it sim spins in an elliptical orbit. Um, the whole concept of atherectomy is based on the differential cutting between elastic tissue that sort of bounces off when you're using a tool like that versus inelastic fiber, uh, calcified tissue where it can literally you know, have selective cutting. 
And of course, when you do that, you generate debris and the debris hopefully is small enough that it can go right through the microcirculation and then be filtered by the reticular endothelial system. Uh, but if the particle sizes are large, which can happen because of operator's technique, um, uh, being too rushed about it, being too aggressive about it, not adequately sizing the burr, you can create a lot of slug sluggish flow in the microcirculation. And when that microcirculation gets affected, that results in infarction and LV dysfunction and hemodynamic collapse and really has a bad outcome. Uh, so um, uh, atherectomy has its role. It, it causes a you know, fracturing of the plaque, allows you better predilation, and then after stenting, you can achieve a greater luminal uh, size, which hopefully results in better expansion. There's actually a term called rotor regret when you don't do it. When you look at that short lesion, you say, ah, this is okay. I can just go ahead and stent it directly, or let me just do a quick balloon on a stent, and you're left with this dog boning uh, sort of appearance of a, of a stent, and then you regret it because now you have a stent that's completely underexpanded. Any operator who's doing in this, in this space should really know the difference between atherectomy devices and what are their benefits, what that, are their risks, what, what are the kind of lesions that you can and cannot apply that in. And this probably 15 minutes is too short to sort of go into too much of that. But uh, suffice it to know there are certain circumstances like osteo lesions, which are probably better than, uh, for uh, uh, orbital atherectomy. Instant restenotic lesions are not approved for orbital atherectomy devices. When there's a lot of tortuosity, probably you know both of the uh, devices have their limitations, and I show you a couple of cases like that as well. So uh, again, orbital atherectomy, as you can see on the left uh, cartoon over here, goes spins in an orbital uh, axis over here, it sort of grinds and sands away at the calcium, uh, whereas whereas the rotational atherectomy device basically looks forward. So. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about from a tool perspective is this uh, intravascular lithotripsy, which I find to be extremely uh, exciting. It's not FDA approved yet in the United States. It probably will be. I was just talking to reps yesterday during a case um, that probably in the next month, two months, the FDA is expected to approve them. I've done probably about 30 cases of this, all sort of using the peripheral balloon. And I have, I have to say it's been very impressive the, the, what it has been able to accomplish. And the whole concept of lithotripsy is that it fractures by generating this sonic wave that applies pressure by about 50 atmospheres, equivalent of balloon inflation pressures. And it's at one second pulses that uh, causes uh, fractures in the, uh, in the inside the vessel wall and allows your, your lesion to sort of expand. It reaches the media and the deep wall of the, of the vessel wall, which orbital atherectomy and rotational atherectomy cannot actually even touch. So um, it sort of causes vaporizing bubbles. Um, these are sort of OCT images demonstrating what happens. This is a pre-procedure image with a uh, concentric ring of calcium. And this is what's happening. You're fracturing the calcium. So when you expand that stent, it's going to expand adequately. So let me jump over some procedures here because I don't want to run out of time. Um, uh, there is uh, obviously the recently uh, sort of trial of disrupt coronary CAD3, uh, which was uh, revealed at TCT last year, demonstrated the safety and effectiveness uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, intravascular lithotripsy, which is why the device is likely to be approved next year. There were no coronary perforations uh, during the particular trials. It's been shown to be safe as long as you know how to use it. You should never inflate the balloon more than four atmospheres. This is not a balloon to be used for high pressure, just optimal pressure, lo low pressures actually, and just apply the treatment and let that do its job. So let's, let's see how you can treat some patients. So this is a case which it was done in Florida. Uh, this man is uh, 65, diabetic, non-STEMI, had his gas done tortuous arteries, severe coronary calcification. And the, the, the physician clearly did not have the tools to do this thing, but yet went ahead and did it. He uh, used a guide liner, uh, struggled to get in a 1.5 and then a 2.0 and a 2.5 balloon, and basically left the, the vessel looking like this, uh, dissected from top to bottom, uh, was not able to drop even more than a two, two millimeter balloon. And so uh, putting a stent was obviously out of the question for him. Left his vessel like that, and the patient fortunately did not closed his artery, came in to see me a couple of months later, and this was his artery, sort of healing uh, dissection, but you can see some residual uh, sort of a separation of the intima. And despite the tortuosity, if you're careful, you, you're slow, you're meticulous with the technique, use a small size bird, like a one, two, five bird, you can actually grind through a lesion like this, expecting that you will create more of a dissection. There's just no way you're not gonna create a dissection, but being prepared for it. So switching it out to a, a wiggle wire, uh, putting in a stent, and now that you atherectomize the vessel wall, you can uh, actually have a proper expansion. And you can see here, 
uh, that the uh, on the right image that the uh, the vessel the stent uh, has expanded quite nicely in the vessel that was previously really severely uh, calcified and dissected previously. This is an example of a CTO PCI that I did about six months ago in a subinternal space. Uh, all the things that we've learned before, you should never go into subinternal space with a with a rotoblader. It's all true. Everything falls apart when you go into the CTO space. And that actually becomes a place where you can actually utilize it. So this is a 75 year old diabetic man. Um, uh, and he, uh, I apologize, this is, he has not had bypass surgery. Um, uh, in the wrong uh, history over here. But you can see here that he's got a CTO of the RCA. It's actually quite calcified. He's got a heavy class three angina. So I went in retrograde through a septal perforator because he didn't really have any healthy zone for re-entry. Uh, the problem here is that uh, the calcium is pretty severe. On the right frame, you can see the, the retrograde wire being externalized into the aorta. Uh, you can snare it with an end snare. And then once you have that, you can advance your um, uh, rota, rota, rota wire, exchange it over the uh, over an anti-grade turnpike catheter, and then go ahead and, and, and rota blade with a 1.25 mm burr uh, to, uh, to optimally manage that lesion so that your stents that you can deploy, uh, and this patient ended up with three stents from the ostium to the crux is adequately expanded and, uh, and not undersized and not underdeployed. Uh, this patient has done obviously quite well so far. This is a case that I did uh, about maybe three or four weeks ago, uh, just an enormously uh, challenging case uh, where uh, it really sort of pulled every single trick and technique that I had to potentially use. The access is a problem, the guide support is a problem, there's tortuosity, there's protuberant, bulky calcification and uh, which device to use and what technique to use here. So started off with a 1.25 millimeter burr, knowing that I would need something small to reach this end. So obviously the 125 burr went quite nicely into the mid segment, but out here it could not even cross it. And this sharp bend at the bottom of the RCA would simply not allow, it was hitting like a concrete wall. And, and there was no way to dilate this lesion with the balloon. Um, I mean, even a one millimeter balloon would not cross this one. So I swapped it out. Fortunately, I was able to chain the wire and, and was able to advance an orbital atherectomy catheter um, and was able to go through the lesion, which actually improved quite significantly. So then I used the high speed for to manage the top and bottom lesions, but th there was still, I wasn't able to, to uh, get adequate expansion of a balloon. So I went back to the concept of a rotational atherectomy here, um, using a 175 and a two millimeter burr. And despite that, you can see here, that there's severe residual bulky calcification. Now, you can use a non-compliant balloon, but then be prepared that if this bulky calcium perforates the vessel, there is no way you're gonna be able to get a, a covered stand to cover this area. It just won't because even a, a regular sized balloon will not go there. But this is about just taking the extra time and being patient and making sure you optimize the result. So um, uh, having all the tools, uh, you know, fortunately I was able to deliver a, a shockwave balloon actually here after the 2 uh, burr went through, I switched it out to a wiggle wire, put a four, a four millimeter by 30 millimeter shockwave balloon, gave about eight therapies for it, and then ended up with a 4.0 and 4.5 stents, which were adequately expanded and, and you know, didn't have any complication here. Um, what about a uh, uh, patient in shock? This is a gentleman who had surgery and one hour post cabbage has ST elevation, which goes into shock, his pressure is now in the 60s and 70s, the multiple pressors, his EF dropped from normal down to about 25%, and he's just barely surviving. We bring him to the cath lab. This is my colleague, uh, Angiogram, and he calls me and saying, you know, what do we do at this point in time? This is a severely calcified left main and LED. The flow in the LED is down. It's lima graft. His circumflex doesn't have good flow. Um, unfortunately, the mammary artery, one hour post cabbage has gone down, and so has his uh, vein graft to the circumflex artery. And so um, difficult kind of a situation that we're in, and so the first thing to do is to stop and provide hemodynamic support, place an impeller catheter, um, think out your strategy. And there is again, no way to do this procedure uh, with that kind of flow with, without an impeller uh, in place. So we did that. Once the impeller is in, in place, you have some time and support. I was able to provide, um, I'm not sure, I, here you go. This is a 1.25 millimeter burr, which you would never do in somebody with a blood pressure of 70 with sluggish flow uh, in a normal situation. But there really was just no way to drop a balloon and, and, and yeah, st stent uh, expansion here would be pretty much impossible. Getting that balloon uh, rotoblader in allowed me to switch it out to a wiggle wire, drop in a 3.5, uh, 30 millimeter shockwave balloon, 
dilated that area, got the flow back in the LED, uh, went back and treated the left main and put in two stents in the LED and was able to get the, get the flow back up to the ostium. Then went back and now with the luxury of having the, circum, uh, the impeller and support uh, in place, uh, wired the circumflex quickly and, and treated this with the rotational astrectomy, 1.25 millimeter burr, repeated the shock wave uh, in the left main and the proximal portion of the circumflex artery, put a stent in the, uh, uh, in the circumflex and um, I ended up with a nice result and the patient was able to make it out of the hospital and is doing really quite well with no recurrent heart failure admissions. Um, what happens in a CTO case when you have an uncrossable cap? So this is a gentleman who kept coming back with recurrent acute coronary syndromes. His graft keeps shutting down. So while the graft is open, let's take advantage of that to use it as a retrograde conduit for a densely calcified segment uh, of the RCA. So uh, went back retrograde through the graft using a turnpike LP catheter and crossed either with a Confianza Pro 12 wire, but nothing is gonna cross this lesion and no balloon will cross, have ruptured multiple balloons and nothing will go. And the only thing at a time like this that will work for you is going to be that laser. So the laser atherectomy catheter allowed me to advance my retrograde gear uh, into the proximal uh, segment and then externalize the wire. But now what happens is that when you do try and do the reverse cart and nothing goes anti-grade, I have a non-crossable anti-grade cap. So now this case requires an anti-grade laser as well. So both the end was so severely calcified that we had to perform uh, laser atherectomy, both uh, anti-grade and retrograde. And once that was accomplished, then of course the rest of the case became um, much more manageable. And um, uh, this was the final result with, uh, with two, three stents, I think from the ostium of the RCA uh, uh, into, the, into the distal segment and one of the PDA as well. And then I think I have just one, one or maybe two more. This is what happens when you don't treat the vessel the first time with imaging and atherectomy. So uh, Bilal, can uh, we wrap up as soon as possible? Okay, sounds good. Give me just two more minutes. I'll just end up with this particular case. So this patient unfortunately has had two layers of stents in a 3.5 mid LED with two 2.5 millimeter stents overlapping and now has instant restenosis. This is a case that I just did yesterday. This, as you can see in the image here, the stents look completely underexpanded. Um, this is a burr of 1.5 millimeter burr, uh, which actually got trapped for a little bit and I had to pull it out. And then we went back and with a 175 burr, treated that whole vessel, uh, went back with a, uh, there, there's no, I've, I've OCT'd this vessel, it was severely calcified, uh, was able to get a shock wave 3.5 balloon inside it, dilated that, and that allowed me to expand it with a 4.0 balloon. And, and I'm showing this to you, uh, these second images as a still frame, just to demonstrate that if you notice, there's actually a significant stent under expansion over here. And if you compare that same image over here, you can actually see this, the stent frame expanded. So I'm gonna just jump uh, to my um, concluding slide over here. I apologize for being uh, a little bit long here. But uh, so that my, as a conclusion, moderate to calcification is frequent. It acts to a complexity of PCI. Um, wonderful imaging modalities are available that help us to understand the, the distribution and guide our therapy. If you leave it unaddressed, you will leave the patient with a, with a good instantaneous result, but the patient will come back to haunt either you or somebody else. And so uh, if we take care of the lesion the first time around with the devices and the tools that we have available within the constraints that you know, we all live in, especially in Pakistan because of the cost, uh, it, the patient will hopefully have a better outcome and, and any complex PCR operator really should be proficient in the use of all these tools and hopefully uh, use them effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal. That, that is a fantastic and comprehensive uh, you know, eval, you know, talk about a subject that you really need more time to talk about it. Um, I would like to briefly introduce our panel. Uh, you know, and while they're thinking of questions, I'm gonna put one question to you from the audience. Our panel is Dr. Professor Numan Nasir from King Edward, General Suhail Aziz from Armed Forces Institute, Dr. Khawar Abbas Kazmi from NICBD, Dr. Mohammed Isaq, who really needs no introduction, uh, Dr. Javed Tai uh, and uh, Nasir Rahman, Dr. Nasir Rahman, both from AKU. So while our panel is quickly thinking of a question, we only, only have time for one or two questions. Uh, there's a question from the audience, which is very relevant, I think is, and I think there's a misconception that I, I, I would like you to clarify. Will shockwave lithoplasty replace atherectomy? No, I don't think so. I, uh, it's, it's a very important question that I've been thinking about. I think the paradigm will shift for the management of calcific disease. I actually see this as a part of a, uh, of a, of a complementary tool. Um, I think in the 
in lesions where you can get the balloon, you probably will not need to do a routine atherectomy, but there will still be lesions where you will not be able to get the balloon down there. Uh, and I and I and and, and the other problem issue is that the the uh, the the, the, the subintimal uh, calcium that you can treat uh, with rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy, you right. might be able to get a better grinding result. So I think the combination of the two would play a really good role. In in our practice, I mean, we have shockwave. We've had shockwave for quite a fair few months, and uh, you know, rota shock is now very common in our practice because we get these big concentric rings of calcium that are too big for the rota or orbital to ablate. And you also have to sort of do road ablation to get the shockwave down and then actually shock the artery into, say, into submission. Um, any qu questions from the panel? Um, uh, General Sohail, uh, Professor Naman? There's one question from the audience then, if there isn't any from the panel, which uh, they're, they're asking that if the stent is adequately expanded and well opposed, in a severely calcified vessel, would the patient still have worse outcomes in regards to uh, long-term TLR compared to a non-calcified vessel? So I guess the only way to find that out is if you've imaged that vessel. Uh, so many times, if you image these arteries, um, like this particular patient that I just showed you the last um, uh, uh, angiogram, uh, looked like a very nice open artery by the time the procedure was done. The problem is that when you put a, a 275 stent in a 4 artery, and it looks nice and smooth, and you're seeing the luminogram, and you have no idea what the calcium is doing behind. Um, uh, that's a well-opposed stent that will not thrombose, but that's a well-opposed stent that will restenose eventually. And when it does restenose, you now have a layer of metal, and you have calcium behind it that you haven't addressed the first time around. And your life just became a lot harder now because when you try to expand that vessel, it's going to give you a whole lot more trouble. So uh, yes, uh, your immediate result will be good in the, and you won't have thrombosis, but the long-term risk of restenosis are going to be higher. Bilal, there are a lot of questions I can think of, but unfortunately we're out of time. So I think I'm going to hand this over to Nasser Rahman. Thank you so much for a fabulous talk and uh, uh, all the best to you. So Nasser, uh, on to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank Fahim. Uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to moderate our next talk. Uh, and which is on a very important topic of uh, optimizing outcome in high-risk PCI. And our next speaker is one of my favorite, uh, Dr. Abdul Hakim. Dr. Abdul Hakim is an interventional cardiologist and associate professor of medicine at Rutgers University of School of Medicine. Uh, he did his uh, um, MBBS from Afan University Hospital in Pakistan, graduating at the top of his class. His, he completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Wisconsin. and. Uh, uh, and then he did his uh, interventional cardiology fellowship from Cincinnati. He was one. Uh, he has won numerous awards uh, and was awarded as a faculty of the years uh, for faculty of the year by his cardiology fellows. His clinical interest includes complex PCI, and his work on FFR has been widely recognized and included in U.S. national guidelines. His other expertise are uh, basically on structural heart disease interventions, and mechanical circulatory support devices. He has also done, uh, published many articles on these. The panelist of our uh, next talk will be Professor Dr. Abdus Samad. He's Professor Emeritus uh, of Interventional Cardiology, Dr. Sajid Hakam, who is the Interventional Cardiologist at South City Hospital, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nadeem uh, Rizvi, who is the President-elect of Pakistan Society of Interventional Cardiology uh, and Consultant Interventional Cardiologist, and Dr. Abid Lagari, who is an interventional cardiologist. The floor is yours, Dr. Abdul Hakim. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bismillah rahman rahim. Uh, can everyone hear me? No, yes. we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, all right. So I just got texted by us telling you to uh, try to wrap up um, because uh, we're kind of running uh, a bit late. So I'll try to make up. Uh, all right. So I've been asked to talk about optimizing outcomes in high risk uh, PCI. Um, unfortunately, I do not have any disclosures uh, after having spent four years under President Trump. Um, 
So the first question really is, uh, what is a high-risk PCI? How do we define high risk? Who is really at risk? Is it the patient, the physician, the hospital? I guess it's, it's all of the above. Um, uh, there are two terms that are commonly used. One is high risk, the other is context PCI. Um, and this uh, distinction is very important to make. Uh, when we talk about complex or complexity of PCI, typically pertains to the anatomic uh, complexity of disease, the angiographic severity of disease. So for instance, a uh, 60-year-old uh, with preserved LB who has uh, complex anatomy, like an LAD bifurcation that's calcified, a CT of the right, is very different than the same anatomy in an 80-year-old or an 86-year-old who's got multiple comorbidities and severe LB dysfunction. So the risk really pertains to the comorbid status of the patient than, uh, uh, and oftentimes it's hand in hand. Uh, so th there's a term that used called CHIP. I personally do not like that, but that really refers to high-risk patients with high-risk anatomy. And these are context patients, elderly, uh, significant comorbidities, and oftentimes their STS euro scores are high, they're not candidates for uh, surgery, and they have complex disease, what would be typically described as surgical disease. And oftentimes accompanying this uh, is severe left ventricular dysfunction, concomitant valvular disease as well. So there are three very important considerations for a patient who has complex disease and has significant comorbidities. Um, it's important to have a heart team approach where um, a surgeon is involved, the referring cardiologist is involved, and a thorough discussion is undertaken with the family. The risk is outlined clearly and expectations are set up front. And from the institution, it requires a massive commitment, uh, requires not only experienced operators, personnel, cath lab staff, but also financial commitment um, uh, and, and uh, an environment that's conducive uh, to doing high-risk procedures. And obviously having the right toolbox, state-of-the-art devices is imperative in having a state-of-the-art program. Uh, so uh, the Sky uh, uh, writing group put a document together fairly recently describing high risk and uh, they put this nice, um, nice picture where they define anatomy as severe multivessel disease, calcified disease, uh, bifurcation lesions, CTOs, uh, the comorbid status of the patients and obviously the equipment that's needed to undertake uh, such, uh, such PCI. So this together really um, represents what a high-risk PCI entails. So let's talk about, in order to understand risk, it's important to know what the risk of a bread and butter elective outpatient PCI is. Now, I'll be honest, uh, less than 5% of what I do is elective outpatient PCI, and that's really been the trend over the past uh, several years in the U.S., less than 40% of PCIs that are done are elective outpatients. Most of them really are inpatients, acute coronary syndrome patients or patients who are referred with complex multivessel disease. So for an elective stable patient, uh, the in-hospital mortality is less than 0.2%. Uh, risk of major adverse events in hospital is less than 0.5%. So that's really your your, your baseline risk for stable PCI. What is the risk of high-risk PCI? I'll share with you a study uh, from the Harvard group from Brigham and Mass General, a thousand patients with surgical anatomy, patients, uh, all of them underwent PCI. Uh, about a quarter of them were not surgical candidates. Uh, the presentation was uh, ACS and about half, a uh, third had left main disease and about 70% significant multivessel disease. In hospital mortality was 7% for patients who were surgery ineligible versus 1% for those who could have gotten surgery. So a six times higher risk for a high risk patient versus a complex patient. So this is one way of looking at it. Now, in other terms, if you do the math, this is a 35 times higher risk for a high risk PCI uh, compared to stable patients. And yet a six fold higher risk than plain complex anatomy. 
So that's collective healing. So that is really the risk we're talking about. Uh, again, uh, pictorial representation of what I just said. Uh, obviously, when we talk about high-risk PCI, we're really not referring particularly to cardiogenic shock or arrest patients who are often patients with, 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 with STEMIs that is put in a separate, separate uh, pool. So there are specific challenges to high-risk uh, patients. Immediate uh, risk include because you're doing context anatomy, uh, the risk of coronary perforations, um, coronary dissection, um, better procedural MI, and then you know extracardiac um, complications, including systemic embolization, stroke, uh, nephropathy, vascular complications, and then non-PCI-related adverse events. Since patients are elderly, have comorbidities, they could have uh, complications or adverse events related to that. And essentially, then the relative benefit is best defined by the patient, which is often subjective. But I would say the highest risk patients are the ones that are most likely to yield yet the high, highest clinical benefit too. There are two important concepts when it comes to high risk and context PCI. One is completeness completeness of revascularization, and then uh, the question of whether you should use mechanical circulatory support. And it has been demonstrated time and again that the degree of completeness of revascularization is strongly associated with reduced death, repeat revascularization, MI, and MACE. Um, another important point, while the Syntex study showed that in complex anatomy, surgery was better in long term, but if you look at patients who got PCI and got completely revascularized, they did actually as good as surgery at five years compared to PCI that was incompletely revascularized. So that's got to be kept in mind. Uh, in the US, uh, Impella is approved for high-risk PCI as well as cardiogenic shock. This is a PROTECT2 trial that everybody is familiar with. About 500 patients were randomized to complex PCI. Now these patients are really high risk these are patients who had unprotected left main or the last bit of conduit severe LV dysfunction or severe multivessel disease with severe LV dysfunction. They underwent either balloon pump or impella assisted PCI. And again, if you look at their um, baseline characteristics, they, um, this is a high risk cohort, about 90% with CHF, uh, severe LV dysfunction, high SDS, and really significantly high uh, syntax scores. And uh, uh, at 30 and 90 days, uh, there was a significant reduction in MACE, which was uh, largely uh, attributable to, to lower repeat revascularization. But if you look at the composite of MI, stroke, and death, that was lower in the impella arm. And that was largely driven by the fact that patients who got an impella got more complete revascularization. Now, uh, oftentimes we think of LV dysfunction, multivessel disease, we say, well, surgery is the way to go. But one thing that is really overlooked from the PROTECT2 is that when you completely revascularize patients, about half of them do get an absolute increase in their ejection fraction by a median of 13%. Uh, there is significant reverse remodeling, and this reverse remodeling occurs more frequently when you have greater um, uh, revascularization, more complete revascularization, which in turn translates into lower events. The important question is when to use MCS support. Again, like I said, the highest risk indication is uh, really based on the fact that you're going to have hemodynamic stability that would enable you to do more thorough revascularization and hence uh, have reduced events. But I would caution you, blanket therapy for all high-risk PCIs with MCS is going to lead to net clinical harm. You do not use mechanical circulatory support in every single high-risk patient, and we are going to go over that. Um, I'm going to go uh, show you a few recent cases I've done, uh, just to highlight uh, the risk and the complexity. Uh, and these are all female patients, just to keep with the theme. Um, so the first is a 70, 80 year old, uh, has end-stage renal disease, severe COPD, uh, presented with a non-STEMI, had an injection fraction that was mildly depressed, 40 to 45%. This is her anatomy. Um, 
uh, she has a tight osteocalcified um, right, uh, severe osteo uh, left circumflex, uh, mid left circumflex disease, uh, eccentric calcified left main, uh, proximal LED. She was evaluated by the heart team uh, because of severe COPD and stage renal disease or SDS was uh, high. She was declined and um, um, she was brought to the CAT lab for complete revascularization. Uh, she has uh, single axis was used, impella was placed, uh, the, the right was treated uh, with, uh, again, uh, Dr. Murad went over this extensively. I'm not going to belabor the point, but um, the right was successfully uh, recanalized. Uh, as you can see, the left main was iris, was significant with a MLA of less than three. The left circumflex was uh, treated um, and um, stented and finally uh, rotation atherectomy of the LED was performed and uh, a crush of the left main was performed. Um, with the impella in place, the patient uh, tolerated all three vessel um, atherectomy pretty well uh, and had complete revascularization. A good result was discharged home a few days later. The next case is uh, rather extreme, a 93-year-old female. She's only 40 kilograms, very frail. She's actually the grandmother of our cat lab manager, got admitted about six times over the past four months with uh, non-STEMIs, flash pulmonary edema, has severe LV dysfunction. And on her sixth admission, the family finally decided we should cat her because she keeps coming back. She is pretty uh, competent, independent, although very tiny and frail. Uh, she was brought to the cat lab, and here's her anatomy. Uh, you can see she's got horrible disease, the osteo LED is 99%, mid LED is a CPO. Left circumflex has a very eccentric, nasty looking lesion, um, which is really the only artery that is supplying her heart and then you know, the Sone Pesohaga is the osteal right, which is also heavily calcified and nasty looking. So uh, obviously looking at this anatomy in a 93 year old, I'd like everyone to think how would they, they would want to approach this, but uh, obviously it took her off the table. The chief of surgery said, hell no. I had a long discussion with the patient, the family, and they agreed we should do something. Uh, so, in this case, it decided not to use an impella because she is only 40 kilograms, tiny. My concern was she would get a vascular injury. So we went ahead, treated the right, uh, put multiple stents there. Uh, the problem was the left circumflex. And since this was really the only big patent artery, it did not heal, had to use <laughs> Or one fiber burden cross at maximum speed, which is about 225,000. Finally, a one two fiber is able to cross at close to 200,000. During the birth, she really dropped her blood pressure, required transient support with phenylephrine, but soon recovered. The left circumflex was then iris and stented, um, and finally opened up the LAD CTO uh, and stented that. So this took a good three hours, but the patient did fine, uh, stayed in the hospital for another week and was only discharged um, to a rehab and then home. And finally, this is a fairly recent case, a 65 year old a female, she has severe multiple sclerosis. She's essentially crepper. She presents with a high risk non stemi rising troponins. Um, Here's her anatomy. Uh, she's got uh, distal left main, severe left circumflex disease, a right that's a CPO, uh, diffusely disease, long 90% LED. Her EF is preserved. Um, so while um, this is more a complex anatomy, her risk profile would not 
essentially qualify as as high risk. And this patient was uh, the, the the CTO was opened first. I uh, was um, stented, as you can see, and then uh, we turned our attention to the left circumflex. Uh, the left circumflex was, uh, as you can see, it was not healing. Was uh, rotoplated, stented. Finally, the LED was open and a crush of the left wing was performed. And the patient did actually pretty well, went home two or three days later. Um, so here's my suggested approach, a few points, some of you may not agree with this, but you know, the most important thing about high-risk PCI is really having a very good heart team and heart team approach. And that involves the surgeon, the referring cardiologist, obviously having a very frank discussion with the patient, the family, uh, setting expectations, um, uh, talking about the real risk, but at the same time, emphasizing that these patients actually do receive the highest benefit from BCI. Timing your case is very uh, important. You shouldn't be starting this case at 8 p.m. at the end of your day. Uh, you should not rush, you should not take shortcuts. Uh, avoid intubating the patient uh, if you have to, if you anticipate the patient would have issues. It's better to do it electively than to do it emergently on the table. Uh, careful planning is key. Having a good plan set in mind before uh, going is important. Making sure all the items that you need are available in the room. Um, and, and for those who are early in their experience, it's very, very, very important to have experienced set of hands um, in, 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 in the lab assisting you. It's very important when you come to the cath lab, you put your lead on and leave your ego outside the room. Uh, make sure uh, patients are pre-treated with DAP, use heparin for most cases, avoid using 2 d 3 as um, They are going to come and haunt you. Address the lowest the risk lesion first. And as far as MCS is concerned, I would, I would say that you should use it fairly selectively, uh, and, and I use it in patients who have profound LV dysfunction, hemodynamically tenuous, patients with very high syntax, if the left main is calcified, or this left main that will require rotation at the rectomy and the right is the CTL. I use single axis in most cases, uh, pre-close it, try to use PA, a catheter monitoring, um, in most cases. Obviously, you need good guide support using guideliners, Avoid rotor regret, that it definitely increases the, uh, the risk of adverse events. Lesions that need rotational atherectomy uh, would declare to themselves. You do not actively need to look for calcium and I was to justify uh, rotational atherectomy. So that's something I would, I would caution you about. Uh, and do not do unnecessary injection. Is a setup shot to IVAS if I would PCI IVAS one image blind salmon mm -hmm. approach more than 100 eyes. Uh, stick to your planned bifurcation strategy, improvise as needed. And most importantly, this, these are high risk patients, complex anatomy you should be really, really good at, at, at uh, tackling complications. Do not panic, do not freak. You're the captain of the ship. If you panic and freak, then you can imagine what's going to happen to cat lab staff. Uh, most importantly, learning how to deal with perforations using uh, two guide catheters, putting a pericardial drain, doing auto transfusions is, is something you need to be uh, very good with. And remove the MCS as soon after the procedure as possible. And then final thoughts. Like I said, heart team approach is very important. Uh, you need a dedication. technically challenging cases, yet the most rewarding. And then I will also say, not many people will say this, but high-risk PCI is actually high-risk PCI, you know, risk anatomy. So that is one way of looking at it too. Thank you very much for um, the opportunity. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Abdul Hakim. Um, there are a lot of questions, uh, but we are unfortunately running out of time. Um, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Professor Dr. Abdul Samad if he can have any question or comment. Uh, Professor Dr. Abdul Samad.
Thank you. I really enjoyed the spectrum of patients we presented and uh, did it because when we started with interventional procedures, these were uh, cases which uh, even the surgeons used to be afraid of doing them because it were high risk patients. But I think with the care and courage, the interventional procedures have gone up and now much more patients can benefit with non-invasive procedures. And uh, I think this is a good hope to see such patients that we can do them. And we have to have good support, hemodynamic support, so that a complete revascularization is done. And the LV function is improved because if you don't do the complete revascularization, the LV function does not improve in majority of patients. They, they, they started with a 35% and then after uh, three months, four years, they are still at 35% and uh, taking a lot of medications for their LV dysfunction. But if you do a complete revascularization, no question that you will have a, a, an improvement in the LV function. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Sajid Hasab, if he would like to have any comment or question. Yes, uh, Hakeem, that's a very good presentation. I just have one quick question. I understand yes, that can you hear me? Yes, yes. I think, yeah, complete is better than partial revascularization. I understand it. But in this high risk, unstable patients, I think it's better just to, wouldn't it be better just to fix the target of the problematic vessel and get out and let the patient recover and then deal with the other things later? Yes, sir, you bring out a very important point. See, like I said, when we talk about high risk, um, yes, you're referring to a patient who's in cardiogenic shock. There's one, one culprit, obviously, in a patient who's, who's really unstable. Uh, the LED is occluded. There's a CT of the right, and maybe there's a 90% CERC. Yes, you open up the LED, um, stabilize the patient. I I'm not advocating you go ahead and, and, and fix the CT of the RCA. Now, typically when we talk about high risk, complex PCI, these are really, really patients where you've had a chance to do an angiogram, have the heart team review them. These are really not patients who are in shock uh, where there's, uh, you've got to do salvage and that's really your only chance to, uh, to treat them. Yes, in extremely acute situations, MIs, um, occlusions, shock patients, you, you try to open up the culprit artery, let the patient stabilize, and then, then stage the other, other vessels. But if you're going to electively go in, and obviously if the kidney function is stable, uh, you try to stabilize <coughs> as much. Obviously, if creatinine is borderline, you don't I don't advocate you you try to fix all all the lesions at the same go. Obviously that 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 is understood. Thank you, Dr. Sajid, Dr. Akima. Uh, one last question and then I will hand over to my colleague Dr. Usman. This is from Dr. Bashir Anif. The question is we don't have uh, MCS in uh, in Pakistan. What should we do? We only the only MCS we have is IABP. And what do you think why the MCS trials fail to show any mortality benefit? So I, I, th I think there are two parts. As far as if you don't have uh, MCS, use uh, uh, if you don't have Impella, use a balloon pump. Uh, it does provide support. Um, although I will say, uh, if you look at the, the BCIS study of uh, IABP supported complex PCI that versus not using IABP, that was negative. Uh, I shared with you PROTECT2 results. Uh, the benefit really mostly is derived from, uh, from lower repeat revascularization. There's really no uh, consistent signal of mortality benefit, even in the cardiogenic shock 
uh, arena, MC has, has never been proven, has never been proven to improve mortality, okay? So because you have Impella in Pakistan, yes, maybe perhaps you could not do as aggressive vascularization in one setting, but uh, I will uh, declare to you that uh, MCS has never been proven to have a survival benefit. With this, sir, I conclude this talk. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Hakim and all our panelists. And I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Usman Him, for the next talk. Thank you, uh, everyone, for a great talk so far. And I can say that since working in Pakistan, I've found newfound respect for IABPs and uh, what you can achieve with them. So um, moving on, um, I'm super excited to be uh, introducing the next speaker. Uh, he's a dear friend and a mentor and uh, probably the person who's had the most impact on, on my own personal career. Um, we're truly fortunate to have with us today, Dr. John Forrest. Um, he's an international cardiologist and associate professor at Yale School of Medicine. Uh, he received his medical degree from the Yale University School of Medicine and then stayed on for his residency and fellowship training. He currently serves as the director of both international cardiology and of the structural heart disease program. Uh, he's been co-investigator on all of the core valve and evolute transcatheter heart valve trials and has uh, published extensively uh, on TAVR and uh, specifically on uh, TAVR and bicuspids as well. He's co-authored the academic research consortiums proposed uh, guidelines uh, for standardized uh, neurological endpoints for clinical trials and serves on several national and international committees. For his uh, talk, our panel of experts is Dr. Asad Patan, uh, Chief of Cardiology at Tabba, Dr. Bashir Hanif, uh, Medical and Executive Director at Tabba Heart Institute, um, and uh, Dr. Nadeem Rizvi, um, Professor of International Cardiology and President-elect Pakistan Society of International Cardiology, Dr. Thayer Sagir, P Professor of Cardiology um, at uh, NICVD, uh, Dr. General Sohail Aziz, uh, Pas Kamanat, an International Cardiologist at AFIC and National Institute of Heart Diseases, and Dr. Asad Khan, uh, International Cardiologist at Shifa International. So I'm going to hand it over uh, to John. Good to see you and looking forward to your talk. Osman, thank you very much. Um, I trust you guys can hear me okay here. So I'm going to work to cover sort of two cases, two, two topics here, uh, both uh, TAVR in women as well as uh, TAVR in bicuspid aortic valves. I think both interesting topics. Um, and so I'll dive right in for the, sake of, uh, for the sake of time here. Here are my disclosures. So really our learning objectives here are to, to review gender differences in aortic valve replacement, both surgical aortic valve replacement and transcatheter aortic valve replacement, to discuss the relative benefit derived from TAVR in women versus men that's been seen in clinical trials. And then to look at some of the TAVR um, data that's come out recently from bicuspid aortic valve disease. So let's start by looking at surgical aortic valve replacement in women. This was a large study that was published out of the national inpatient sample um, from September of 2017 and was really an enormous study. So it looked at all patients who underwent surgical aortic valve replacement uh, between 2003 and, and 2014 um, in the United States broke it down where you had about 52,000 males and 33,000, almost 34,000 females, and then did propensity matching analysis of that. So remember, this is surgical aortic valve replacement. And what we saw here in these, in these patients is that uh, men did better than women. And so the mortality for men was better than women when we looked both at the raw data and also when we looked at the propensity matched data. So you can see here, that with regards to the in-hospital death, you know, significantly favoring men, uh, as well as when we looked at vascular complications, acute kidney injury, blood transfusions, and other things. All there also significantly favoring men um, over women. And so it's, I think it's safe to say that for surgical aortic valve replacement, women have increased mortality and worse outcomes as compared to men. And this is actually quite well established. In fact, if you use the STS risk score calculator and you click over from change your patient from being a male to a female or vice versa, when you click the female box, you get a higher STS score and increased 30 day mortality. 
So what about for transcatheter aortic valve replacement? Well, the very early studies, so if we look at the initial partner studies for extreme risk patients undergoing transcatheter aortic valve replacement, there was a little bit of a suggestion that maybe this was going to be similar. Maybe women were also going to do a little bit worse than men did with transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And if we looked, what we saw was that a lot of the complications were higher in women than they were in men. But we've learned a lot since then. And so this was the 30-day data from the extreme risk uh, arm of the partner study. But when we extended this out and looked at the one-year data, we actually saw that uh, women had a lower one-year uh, unadjusted all-cause mortality than men did and also had a lower hospitalization rate. And so this started bringing up some suggestions. You know what, maybe, maybe there's going to be differences between transcatheter aortic valve replacement and surgical aortic valve replacement. And in fact, when we then looked at the high risk data, what we saw is that the death at 30 days was the same between both groups. Women did have more complications than men did. They had a slightly higher incidence of stroke. They had more bleeding. They had more vascular complications. But when you started to look out past 30 days and look more towards the late outcomes, what you started to see is actually that women were doing better than men with regards to survival. That was seen at one year, at two years and carried out. And again, this is for high risk patients. And so my group led a, okay, let me finish up here. Again, this is just a central illustration from this paper showing that where we, here we have um, the females in the, the red dash and males in the blue dash. And you can see months after the TAVR procedure, incidence of death was lower for women, although incidence of stroke and significant bleeding was higher for women. So more complications, but actually seeming to do a little bit better in terms of mortality. We led a large study looking at all patients um, who had undergone TAVR uh, for women using Evolute and core valves. And what we saw in that was that women tend to be a little bit higher risk based on their STS score. They were a little bit older and they were certainly a little bit more frail in terms of their activities of daily living, their albumin and other findings. But what we saw is despite those differences, despite being a little bit more frail, despite um, having a little bit of a higher STS score, when you looked at their months post procedure, they actually did exceptionally well as compared to men. In fact, all of the numbers suggested a little bit better as compared to men. And so when you then looked at the core valve high risk data and you broke it down based off of a number of things, age, gender, et cetera, what you saw is that females tended to derive more benefit from TAVRs than men did. And this sort of makes sense. If, if women do worse with surgery than men do, and they do equivalently or maybe a little bit better with transcatheter aortic valve, then that difference between surgery and transcatheter aortic valve replacement is going to be greater for women than it is for men. If we then look over to the partner three data, so this is now low risk patients undergoing transcatheter aortic valve replacement, we saw a similar thing here. And in fact, a pretty remarkable thing here is there wasn't just a little bit of a difference between uh, men and women, but in fact, women didn't cross that, uh, that, that, that zero mark there and did significantly better with TAVR than they did with surgical aortic valve replacement. And so in fact, this data would suggest that TAVR should really be your first line therapy for low risk patients if they're women. They do significantly better with TAVR than they do with surgery. Men, the numbers favor it, but it does cross that zero line. And so I think in summary here, what we can say is that for transcatheter aortic valve replacement, Women ha do have increased complications. They do have some increased vascular complications and bleeding, but they have similar short-term and they actually have better long-term mortality as compared to men. And as a result of worse outcomes with surgery and equivalent or better outcomes with TAVR, women actually derive even more benefit from TAVR than men do. And so when we're looking at our patients and we're taking into account uh, various factors that may favor surgical aortic valve replacement or transcatheter aortic valve replacement, I think it's important to note that. I wanna move on to talk a little bit about bicuspid aortic valve disease here. So if we look at bicuspid aortic valves, um, this is data from the United States. Um, it's quite common, it's very common in younger patients. And in fact, one in five patients uh, over the age of 80 have bicuspid aortic valve. And if we look at under the age of 80, it's almost 50% of patients who undergo uh, aortic valve replacement have a bicuspid aortic valve. 
I'm, I'm going to skip over a little bit for the sake of time, the Severs classification system here. Um, but what I will say is that when we look at bicuspid aortic valves, what we found is that CT analysis can help us a lot, especially when there's heavy calcification where echo can be difficult. Scrolling up and down on, the, on a CTA can be quite beneficial uh, in showing us the Severs classification. Here we see a Severs type 1 with fusion of two of the leaflets. And it's important to note that in early TAVR experiences using first generation valves, uh, outcomes in patients with bicuspid aortic valve were inconsistent, and there were significant concerns about paravalvular leak, stroke, and hemodynamics. So we did a large uh, look back from the TVT registry in the United States. All patients who are undergoing a transcatheter aortic valve replacement have to be put into the TVT registry. And so we looked at cases between January and June um, of 2014 to 2018. There were about 46,000 patients who underwent TAVR with one of the self-expanding systems. The majority of those cases were tri-leaflet cases, but that left a little over 12,000 patients who had TAVR for a bicuspid aortic valve. We took those patients and then compare and then evaluated them whether they had got a core valve, an Evolute or an Evolute Pro, sort of looking at the development of uh, technological advances, knowing that there had been some significant issues with the core valve um, and the early generation transcatheter valves. And what we saw in this is that as the valves got better, we saw a decline in all cause mortality rate and also similarly a decline in the incidence of new pacemakers. So that led us to uh, look further into this. So to dive deeper into bicuspid aortic valves versus trileaflet aortic valves. And this is a, a study that we did uh, looking at a similar group of patients uh, and then doing propensity matching to compare how did similar patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis do as, composed to, as compared to patients with tricuspid aortic valve stenosis undergoing TAVR. So propensity match patients again, and let's try to understand is there do they do the same as tricuspid patients? Do they do worse? Certainly early on they did worse, but now we're using the latest generation valves. And what we saw in this study is that in fact, patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease did just about the same as patients with tricuspid aortic valve disease. The curves really match, march out there together. And in fact, if you get out to 12 months, the numerically the bicuspid patients did slightly better, statistically exactly the same. One of the concerns had been risks, had, had been worries about paravalvular leak in these patients. And so if we look at the, the uh, right-hand side of this column here, this is looking at paravalvular leak. And you can see that with our current generation valves, we really have almost gotten rid of all paravalvular leak that's greater than mild, a very small percentage, 1.5 to 2% of patients with greater than mild paravalvular leak, and no difference between whether those were bicuspid or trileaflet patients. Again, this is non-randomized data from the TVT registry. Um, I will also say that from that, we saw that the valve areas and gradients were the same between the two of them. So that led us to the low-risk bicuspid study. So this was a study um, that I led uh, internationally looking at patients who were low risk for surgical aortic valve replacement and had bicuspid aortic valve disease. Uh, it was a single arm study, not a randomized study, uh, where patients, if they had a bicuspid aortic valve disease, if they were low risk and they were symptomatic, were eligible for inclusion. There were some key exclusion criteria, age less than 60, an aortopathy of greater than 4.5 centimeters, as that's an indication to replace the ascending aorta in patients who have a bicuspid aortic valve. And you can see the other things here, prohibitive LVOT calcification and anatomy that's not sized well for a bicuspid aortic valve. The primary safety endpoint was all-cause mortality or disabling stroke at 30 days. And you can see the primary efficacy endpoint there. So how did these patients do? Well, before I get into that, I wanted to talk just briefly about how we sized these patients. There's been a fair amount of debate for those of you who do transcatheter aortic valves in whether we should size bicuspid aortic valves at the level of the annulus, like we do for tri-leaflet valves, or if we should do supra-annular sizing. For this study, I wanna point out that we did annular sizing for all of them. And that was based on a number of things, including the fact that a lot of data has recently come out that shown, has shown that there's significant variability in supra-annular sizing, whereas we really are quite comfortable with annular sizing and do that for all of our transcatheter valves for tri-leaflet patients. 
When we look at the bicuspid study, similar to other studies that we've seen, about half the patients were male and half the patients were female. You can see these patients were fairly young, average age of around 70. The majority of them um, had a type one bicuspid aortic valve, but similar to what we see in the United States, 10% of them have had a type zero bicuspid aortic valve. The vast majority had iliofemoral access, just about 100%. We did use general anesthesia in actually a fair number of these patients. And the reason for that, it, it was strongly encouraged that if you had concerns about your transthoracic echo, that you use a transesophageal echo, because we know transesophageal echo does a much better job of evaluating paravalvular leak. And paravalvular leak was one of the main concerns that we had early on for TAVR and bicuspid valves. So we encourage centers to really be able to, to thoroughly evaluate how well the valve was functioning. And one of the best ways to do that is with the transesophageal echo, which is why you see this high incidence of general anesthesia. I will note that there were five patients or 3.3% that had greater than one valve implanted, which is slightly higher than what we see for trileaflet valves. And here's the sizes of the valves implanted. The majority of them were 29 millimeter uh, or 34 millimeter Evolute valves, a handful of 26, and no patients got a 23 millimeter valve. So how did the patients do? They did exceptionally well. Their all-cause mortality or disabling stroke rate was 1.3%. One patient had each of those within this 150 patient uh, study. There were uh, about 3% non-disabling stroke, a couple of vascular complications. You can see the pacemaker rate was around 14%. Our pacemaker rate does remain a little bit higher for using uh, self-expanding valves than it does for balloon expanded valves. And there was one patient who had a coronary obstruction. When you compare this to your 30-day outcomes in the low-risk uh, studies, the PARTNER3 and the low-risk EVOLUTE study, very, very similar uh, outcomes. In fact, these may be even a little bit better. Notably, with, as we know with uh, self-expanding superannular valves, really almost no patient prosthesis mismatch. Only two patients with a mean gradient of greater than 20. When we look at surgical aortic valve replacement or when we look at uh, balloon expandable valves, this number is closer to than the 10 to 20% range. One of the real benefits of the self-expanding supraannular valves. One of the other concerns was that will you still get good effective orifice areas and mean gradients in bicuspid valves? And you can see really ex excellent results here. You go from average mean gradients of almost 50 down to single digits and average valve areas of less than one to greater than two. The other concern here is what about type zero valves? Are we gonna get more paravalvular leak with those? And when we actually look at that data, we saw that there were no patients that had greater than mild paravalvular leak. And in fact, patients with a type zero valve had even a greater percentage having none or trace. So those patients with type zero tended to do quite well. And this has actually been uh, now validated in a number of studies looking at different valve types um, in terms of superannular, self-expanding, balloon expandable, where type zero patients have done exceptionally well as long as you're picking the right ones when you compare them to type one patients. So I'll finish here. I know we're a little behind time. So some take home points. First is that female sex increases the risk for surgery, but not for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Women benefit from TAVR as compared, compared to surgery even more than men do. Both of them benefit, but the benefit for women is even greater than it is for men. New generation TAVR valves in bicuspid anatomy appears to yield similar outcomes to, to TAVR in trileaflet anatomies. And interestingly, patients with type zero bicuspid valves appear to do as well as TAVR as those with type one bicuspid aortic valves. Thank you guys all very much. Thank you, John. That's a fantastic uh, overview of, of uh, two really important subsets, which I think are becoming increasingly important, especially bicuspids, as we get into lower and lower risk uh, patients. I'd like to ask any of our panelists if they have a question. I have a couple of questions, but um, do our uh, panel members have any questions for Dr. John? Uh, for? Usman, if I can ask John a couple Absolutely. of questions. Dr. John, go ahead. So uh, I guess two questions. Uh, one, John, do you use, uh, like on CT, the amount of calcium in the, for bicuspid this is, the amount of calcium in the leaflet and uh, whether the RAFI is calcified, do you use that information to decide whether you're going to do surgery or TAVR? And the other question is for bicuspid, are you able to use the 
cusp overlap technique and bicuspid valves? So I'll take I'll take both uh, both questions. So uh, you know Raj Makar has published extensively looking at the amount of calcification and the amount of calcification um, along the fused raphi, and certainly in patients, and we know this from trileaflet patients, in patients who have a lot of bulky calcification, um, and, you know heavy bulky calcification of the leaflets or of the left ventricular outflow tract. We know that that's one of the, the risk factors in TAVR. It can be associated if you're using balloon expandable valves and an increased risk of annular rupture. It can be associated with an increased risk of paravalvular leak. So when you're looking at a low risk patient, I think that's something that certainly needs to be taken into account. You have a low risk patient with very bulky calcification. That patient will do well with surgery. And I think, you know, given that we don't have, don't know our long-term results with TAVR in these patients, those are, those are patients that I would favor having going in surgery. They're low risk. They're low risk for surgery. Their anatomy is not as favorable for TAVR. And I would, I'd recommend in those low risk patients that they certainly have surgery. With regards to the cusp overlap view, you know, the cusp, cusp overlap view is really trying to get you to focus in on the non-coronary cusp. And so you can use it um, in a bicuspid valve, although obviously you're not, if, if it's a type zero, you're not actually overlapping any of the cusps, but really what you're doing in that is trying to focus on the non-coronary cusp. So it can work for that. I will say that for bicuspid valves, because you can get some sealing above the level, um, of the annulus that, you know, you, we do, if we're, if we say we're going to on a three leaf of the valve aim for an implant depth of maybe three to five millimeters for a bicuspid valve, we try to aim a little bit higher, maybe two to three millimeters in terms of our depth when we're using uh, self-expandable valve. So you can use the cusp overlap view. Yes. For bicuspid valves. Great. Any other questions from our panel members? Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Sohail Aziz Osman. Great lecture once again. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, so I'm just wondering how often do you use cerebral protection for your tower? Uh, and uh, uh, do you use percutaneous approach for your femoral or do you use surgical cut down? Um, what's your preference in your center? Yep. So um, I'll take the second question first. So we do almost all of our uh, femoral approaches via percutaneous approach. We use two per close in there and it, you know we've been doing that for a while and it works well and I, you know I'd encourage anybody who's still cutting down I think it's there's the safety and efficacy of uh, a percutaneous approach has, has been shown quite well now and I, I'd encourage you to use that. With regards to cerebral embolic protection, it's a very interesting uh, topic. You know, I think the pendulum sort of has swung back and forth about it. I think we all agree that when we look at MRIs of patients after they've had a transcatheter aortic valve replacement, they almost all show some findings there. And that if we could prevent those from coming, it would seem to make sense. But when you actually look at the data, it hasn't shown uh, clear clinical uh, endpoints that have been beneficial in reducing stroke and reducing and improving cognitive function and reducing TIAs, mortality, et cetera. Um, there are some, you know, there are some groups where it's been suggested. Um, interestingly, two of the groups are in women who, who, who numerically tend to have a little bit more incidence of stroke than men do, um, and, and also in bicuspid aortic valves. But those haven't been statistically significant. They've been numerically um, different. We, you know, we have gone back and forth and, and presently we're using it in patients who have sort of nice clean anatomy um, in their carotids and in their, uh, in their right uh, nominant system because we feel that you know, if, if the anatomy is nice and clean there, hopefully our, our risk of causing complications by wiring it is low. Um, you know, when I review papers and manuscripts and look at other stuff, it's clear that there is some risk to, um, to the manipulation that you're doing there when you're putting in the device and you're manipulating the device. Um, and that may offset a little bit of the benefit you get when you capture the debris. So I think the jury is still out on that. I think until um, we either get a positive trial or until there's better reimbursement for it, um, it's not gonna be universally adopted. Great. Great. Um, I had a quick question. So, you know, we looked at our data and there's more data published from Pakistan and almost 30% of our population of, for TAVR turns out to be type zero bicuspids and they uh, are generally quite young, some of them in their 50s. 
your data would suggest that we should be comfortable, you know, barring all other issues, um, comfortable in suggesting Tavar if they're appropriate candidates. Do you do you agree that should we be looking at 60 and younger? Is age relevant in bicuspids? What are your thoughts? On yeah, so so it's a great question. So remember, in these studies, we we had an age cutoff of 60. So we didn't do patients who were younger than 60. And I don't think that the issue becomes um, the first valve that you put in. I think the, the first valve that you put in is going to work very well. I think we can expect it to last 10 to 15 years based off bench top data and the early data that we have. I think the issue with transcatheter valves, especially if you're using supraannular valves, becomes when you put in that second valve. And that's where I think we need to think about our younger patients. So if, you have, if you're taking a 55-year-old and you're doing a transcatheter aortic valve and you're putting in a supraannular valve, if, if 10 or 15 years down the line, you're putting in another one, you're going to really be restricting the ability to access the coronary arteries and other things in that patient. And so for me, it doesn't come down to how well is this first valve going to perform? What are my outcomes going to be at, at one year and at five years, et cetera? I have, I have no concerns about that at all. But it becomes in 10 or 15 years when I have to put another one in, then what happens five years after that other one goes in? That's not a relevant question for a 75 year old, but that is a relevant question for a 55 or a 60 year old. And so I, I think that's really what you need to think about. And, and we don't have the answer for that presently, Osman, right? We don't have the answer for what am I gonna do for that second valve in that low risk patient to make sure I can get back into the coronaries. I think a lot of us feel we'll get there, we're working hard in technologies, we'll have an answer by the time most of these patients come around but we don't have that answer yet. And so you're, it's a little bit of a roll of a dice of taking a really young patient and saying, don't worry, when we need to do this again in 10 or 15 years, we'll have the answer by then, even though we don't have it now. Um, hi, uh, sorry. Hi, John, it's Asad here. So just a couple of questions. And do you uh, always pre-dilate in your uh, bicuspids? Because we know that uh, they are associated with a slightly higher risk of stroke. And we also know from various studies that there is a slightly higher risk of stroke when, with uh, sort of associated with the time of balloons, ballooning that you do, whether it be pre. I think we lost him there. But okay. if you want to answer that question about the pre dilation. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take it. So, so uh, yes, we pre-dilate for all of our bicuspid valves. Um, I think it prepares the annulus better, certainly with self-expanding valves, uh, you get some better expansion. And for us, it's been associated with less need to post-dilate. So yes, absolutely pre-dilate for your bicuspid valves. You don't need to aggressively pre-dilate. We choose actually um, a semi-compliant balloon. So we don't use a true balloon for our pre-dilatation. We size it. Yep, we size it to the minimal diameter of the annulus. So we don't do the mean, we take the minimal diameter to the annulus. Um, you know, the, the role, the, the impact that balloon dilatation has on stroke is, you know, I think a little bit uh, equivocal, but it is, as I mentioned before, in these patients, if we can use cerebral embolic protection, we will and we will pre-dilate um, all of the patients. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a fantastic topic. We could go on for hours discussing it, but uh, we're going to have to move on here in the interest of time. Thank you again for your talk. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Barbara Hassan, uh, who's going to be introducing another one of our uh, colleagues from Yale um, and a talk on PFO. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, perfect, sorry. So um, uh, the, the next session is about uh, PFO current indication. Before I present uh, the presenter, I am going to um, first talk about our panelists. We have a great set of panelists um, uh, for the session. I have Dr. Ali Nasser Zedi, who is the section head adult congenital heart disease from Mount Sinai Hospital. He's an associate professor and he is a, a, a pediatric and an adult cardiology uh, boarded uh, adult congenital heart disease person. Um, then I have Dr. Saad Shafkat, who is a renowned neurologist um, and he's a professor of neurology at Aga Khan University. Dr. Saad Shafkat um, did his PhD from Duke University and did his 
training in, um, in a neurology from a mass journal at Harvard. And then we have Dr. Najib Basir, who is a consultant adult cardiologist. Dr. Najib Basir has taught many of us who are on this forum, uh, and he is an amazing um, a cardiologist and uh, and has uh, has quite a bit of contribution towards adult cardiology in Pakistan. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Jeremy Esnes um, to okay. give this talk. Is this something I can help you with? Uh, and Dr. Jeremy Esnes is a pediatric interventional cardiologist, associate professor of pediatrics at Yale uh, School of Medicine, and director of cardiac catheterization lab at Yale New Haven Hospital. He's a graduate of Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where he also did his residency. He then went to Cleveland Clinic to do his pediatric cardiology and pediatric interventional cardiology. His clinical interests are include transcatheter heart, heart valve implantation, atrial septal defect and BFO closures, PDA closures, and also uh, aortic interventions, uh, including stent placements and coil occlusions. Um, it is a great pleasure to have him to give this talk on PFO, the current indications. Dr. Jeremy, up to you. Good morning. Can everybody see my screen and hear me? Yes, yes, yes uh, we yes, can. can. Um, thanks very much for having me. I, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, or here uh, at, in my home. Um, so uh, I've been asked to speak about uh, the patient selection process for patent frame and ovale closure. So I will uh, run through that. This is a relatively short talk. Um, so please feel free to interrupt or ask questions at the end. Um, the only disclosure I have, <clears throat> excuse me, pertinent to this is I'm an investigator for the uh, or reduce study for the post-approval portion of the study. Um, so just a, a little brief, um, little brief bit about, uh, sorry, the uh, patent foramen ovale itself. The foramen ovale is uh, a normal part of heart structure. Uh, in fetal life, it allows for blood to move across from the right atrium to the left atrium so that blood returning to the fetus from the, uh, from the placenta uh, reaches the left atrium so that oxygenated blood can head out the aorta and uh, the brain itself gets the highest oxygen content blood. Patency of the foramen ovale we define as persistent opening in that location. Um, after birth, typically left atrial pressures increase and the uh, patent foramen ovale is sealed shut as the two components of the atrial septum push together and, uh, and adhere to one another. But in some patients, uh, fusion of these two components can be incomplete. And autopsy studies have shown that patency of the foramen ovale occurs in about 25% of patients, depending on which study you look at. These images, I think, nicely demonstrate what the PFO looks like uh, in situ. So the fossa ovalis, you can see here in the top right, um, we're really looking at septum primum. Um, and at the uh, upper corner of this picture is septum secundum. And these two components of, of the uh, fossa ovalis, septum secundum and septum primum, um, have a residual small hole, which is the PFO. Looking in from the left side, we can see Again, here is septum primum, this sort of windsock of tissue, and septum secundum up here in this patient who has not had fusion of these two components and has a patent foramen ovale. So why would we ever close a patent foramen ovale if it's present in 25% of the population? Well, there are really sort of two categories I consider. One is uh, rather rare, and that's hypoxia and most commonly for patients with persistent right to left shunt resulting in hypoxia, we see that in patients with orthodeoxia protipnia syndrome, and occasionally in some other rare circumstances um, do we see hypoxia related to a, a persistently patent foramen. And we will occasionally close those for improvement in systemic saturation. The predominant reason, however, that we close BFOs is for uh, the reduction of, or um, treatment of patients with who have paradoxical embolus. Most commonly that results in stroke, 
However, other paradoxical arterial emboli do occur, and those typically we see in the retinal arteries, coronary arteries, other peripheral and splanchnic arteries. And very rarely, we would close a PFO prophylactically in patients who are commercial divers to reduce the risk of nitrogen uh, paradoxical embolus related to uh, deep sea diving. We're gonna really focus on stroke uh, as that's sort of the, the topic um, that's most pertinent. So ischemic stroke makes up the vast majority of stroke uh, and has been divided into a bunch of different categories. Um, in the United States and in Europe, about 25% of ischemic strokes are cryptogenic. In other words, the, they are uh, not related to large artery atherosclerotic disease. They're not lacunar strokes related to small vessel disease. They're not related to a cardiogenic thrombus. Um, and they're not related to uh, a dissection or some other uh, inflammatory condition of the arteries uh, in the head and neck. So that 25% um, is quite well documented in the United States and Europe, but the incidence of ischemic stroke, uh, while it's higher in Asia and South Asia, we don't have good data on the stroke subtypes um, for South Asia. So I really don't have a sense of how predominant a problem this is um, outside of uh, the US and in particular in Pakistan. In the late 1980s, uh, folks started to uh, see a, a relationship between the presence of a patent frame in O'Valley and stroke in young patients. Um, this was one of the early studies from 1988 that showed that in patients who had stroke uh, in, in a young age group, 40% um, had a PFO versus 10% uh, in a control group. And this really started a, a, a three decades long debate about the relationship between PFO and stroke and a debate that continues on uh, to this day. And I think we could spend more than an hour going through all of the data that's come out over the last uh, 30 years. Um, but I think the, the, a couple caveats have, have sort of come up uh, from all of that data. It seems that PFO is in fact associated with a recurrent risk, a recurrence risk for stroke for patients who have had a cryptogenic stroke. And there are some uh, features of the PFO that are relevant. The anatomy of the PFO um, can uh, increase risk as best we can tell. So the presence of an atrial septal aneurysm um, will increase the risk uh, of recurrent stroke, as well as the size of the PFO or the PFO diameter. In addition, the, the resting physiology of the PFO seems to play a role in risk. So how much flow goes across the PFO? What is the shunt size? Um, what's the direction of the shunt? Is there a resting right to left shunt? And can you provoke a larger shunt with a Valsalva maneuver? All of those things have been associated with an increased risk. Most recently in September of 2017, we saw the publication of, of three important uh, clinical trials. One was uh, the RESPECT trial, which was a trial of the Amplatzer PFO device. Um, and this was in 2017 was the long-term data from that trial, which showed uh, more convincing evidence that PFO closure uh, in fact could reduce the risk of stroke. Um, and simultaneously, we saw the publication of the Gore Reduce clinical study, um, which also showed a significant reduction in the risk of stroke after PFO closure. Um, and as well, the publication of the CLOSE trial, um, which uh, similarly though used multiple devices, uh, showed a uh, reduction in risk. I'm going to talk just very briefly about the, the Reduce and RESPECT trials. Um, these were uh, initiated in 2008 and 2003, respectively. And you can see that this is part of the problem is it's taken many, many years to, to enroll a significant number of patients. Um, and in fact, the, the target numbers for these trials reduced over time because of enrollment was so challenging. Um, also importantly, these studies look at patients in general less than 60 years of age. Both were prospective, both were multi-center. Um, they had a control arm and, and, a, random, and a randomized uh, um, enrollment with randomization to device versus medical management. Importantly, in the reduced trial, um, 
the patients who received a device also continued on antiplatelet therapy uh, along with the device. Um, in the RESPECT trial, that was not necessarily the case. Both were open label, uh, and you can see the primary endpoints were uh, most importantly freedom from uh, recurrent stroke. The REDUCE trial uh, interestingly looked for the presence of silent brain infarction um, or occult brain infarction with a follow-up MRI uh, after closure. So the data from the RESPECT trial, again, this is the Amplatzer trial, um, showed a statistically significant reduction in the rate of uh, recurrent stroke in patients who had undergone PFO closure. And this was fairly dramatic with a hazard ratio of nearly 0.6. Um, And if we look at the Kaplan-Meier assessment from that trial, you can see that part of the reason that early on we did not understand the benefit as well as we understand it now was because early studies really only looked at 24 month uh, data. Uh, and at 24 months, we just start to see these curves separate and we start to see the benefit of PFO closure uh, over time. The reduced trial uh, similarly showed a significant reduction uh, in the number of recurrent strokes in patients who had undergone PFO closure. Interestingly, in this trial, um, even patients who had undergone PFO closure continued to have silent brain infarction at a rate not statistically significantly different from those who had not undergone PFO closure. The reasons for that are, are a topic of debate. Um, I am curious to know if perhaps some of these silent infarcts were related to uh, the implant of the device itself, uh, but that has not been able to be demonstrated. If we look over time for the REDUCE study, we see similar findings that really uh, it takes some time to see the benefit, although in the REDUCE study benefit was seen uh, earlier than in the, in the um, RESPECT trial um, with a significant uh, difference between those undergoing PFO closure and those uh, on medical management alone. Importantly, uh, both of these trials, or sorry, the reduced trial uh, only allowed for antiplatelet medication, which has been the standard uh, in the United States for some time um, and did not allow patients uh, to be on anticoagulation. In terms of safety, um, the serious adverse event rates for these trials were quite low, and most of the serious adverse events were transient and treatable. An important topic in, these, in this patient population is the presence of atrial fibrillation following device closure. Uh, there's uh, uh, some expectation that these devices, which are lying on the surface of the atria, cause some irritation and inflammatory response in the early uh, time after they're implanted and can be uh, a source of atrial arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation. Both the RESPECT and REDUCE trials saw uh, 5 and 7% rates of uh, atrial fibrillation following implant, which was significantly higher uh, than that seen in patients who did not undergo device implant. Those patients had uh, a 1% to 2% incidence of atrial fibrillation. The uh, interesting, interestingly, the uh, Atrial fibrillation in most cases was transient. It didn't recur during the study period and did not lo require long-term medical management for most patients. So the conclusions from these two trials were quite similar. Um, for the RESPECT trial, closure of the PFO was associated with a lower rate of recurrent ischemic stroke than medical therapy alone during extended follow-up. So that was out uh, to 10 years. Um, and for the REDUCE trial, those patients who had, uh, who had PFO closure along with antiplatelet therapy um, had a lower risk of recurrent stroke than those who had not undergone closure. These, both of these trials really demonstrated the benefit of the development of a multidisciplinary team to evaluate patients with uh, cryptogenic stroke and PFO. And so the approach here uh, has uh, grown to be a multidisciplinary team that involves both stroke neurologists and interventional cardiologists. And uh, when needed, we uh, include hematology uh, in those patients who have uh, a significant thrombophilia. We review all patients um, as a group 
who are referred to us for uh, for a, a cryptogenic stroke in the setting of a PFO. And at the end of that review, which includes a review of all of the imaging, uh, the patient history, um, other risk factors, patients and, and providers are provided with a, a consensus opinion from the group. Our clinical and diagnostic assessment includes brain MRI that allows us to look at the location of the stroke uh, and the presence of any occult stroke lesions that may have not been uh, noted previously. Head and neck CT angiogram is the standard, um, although some patients undergo uh, carotid artery Doppler as well. And that's to assess for any vascular abnormality, uh, degree of calcification or stenosis of any of the um, head and neck vessels that could pose a risk for stroke. An assessment for DVT is generally done and that will sometimes include uh, not only a lower extremity duplex Doppler, but occasionally pelvic MRV, particularly uh, in patients where um, we suspect a, an increased risk. For example, a patient who's had a prior motor vehicle accident or somebody who's had pelvic surgery. Um, we also do an assessment for occult atrial fibrillation. So in patients less, to, less than 60 years of age, that's typically a 30-day uh, monitoring um, at home. And in patients greater than 60 years of age, we require at least six months of monitoring with an implanted monitor to be sure that we're not missing uh, occult AF uh, in a population that's at higher risk. We also uh, perform a standard hematologic profile that allows us to screen for any significant thrombophilia. So uh, patients with cryptogenic stroke undergo assessment for PFO with a TEE. Uh, we think that should be the standard approach. It provides uh, much better imaging than transthoracic echo uh, and lets us not only understand whether or not there's a shunt, uh, but what the uh, anatomy of the PFO is uh, in some detail. With that TEE, we perform you know, what we would consider as echocardiographic risk assessment, um, looking at the uh, PFO characteristics and making some assessment of whether we think this PFO uh, could contribute to right to left shunting and could contribute or, or allow for a paradoxical embolus. So high risk characteristics in, in uh, our minds include uh, a tunnel-like anatomy, which you can see here in the upper right-hand corner um, with overlap of septum primum and septum secundum. Uh, you can see a long tunnel in this patient and a fairly wide aperture for this PFO. Um, whether or not a septal aneurysm is present. Uh, and for us, I think various studies have used different definitions for a septal aneurysm with excursion anywhere from 10 to 15 millimeters. Um, I think hypermobility of the septum, uh, as you can see in the bottom panel, uh, is probably more relevant than what the absolute uh, excursion of the septum is. Uh, as you can see in that bubble study, um, there's a, a large provoked shunt during Valsalva here. And the, um, you can see how the septal aneurysm plays into this with its bowing over into the left side, allowing this bolus of bubbles to come through. And for me personally, when I see uh, the passage of a bolus of bubbles, a sort of packet of bubbles that rather than individual bubbles one at a time, in my mind, that also suggests the potential for a larger aperture uh, and the potential for a, a larger thrombus to pass through that PFO. Lower risk characteristics in our mind, the absence of septal mobility. So in some patients, we see a fairly rigid septum with really no motion whatsoever, uh, a small aperture for the PFO, um, and trivial or no shunting, either at, at rest or uh, with provocation. We calculate a rope score um, for patients, although I think that um, the ROPE score provides us more with a framework um, rather than relying on the absolute score. So this was a, a score developed to assess what is the risk, what is the potential that a patent frame in a valley was associated with a stroke. Um, and as you can see on the left-hand side, um, this looks at various patient characteristics, including hypertension, presence of diabetes, history of prior stroke, smoking status, uh, and the topography of the, of the uh, infarct on brain imaging. So cortical infarcts uh, far and away are, are more likely to be uh, embolic in nature. 
And then importantly, age is a factor because as our patients age, there are risk factors for other causes of stroke, particularly atherosclerotic disease uh, increase. Um, and using the scoring system, uh, this data allowed the calculation of a score that provided some assessment of how likely was it that the PFO was related uh, to the stroke. So again, we, I don't really rely on these uh, to say to a patient, well, it's 88% chance that your uh, PFO was related to your stroke, but it does provide a framework to help us think about uh, individual patients um, and, and how their PFO might play into their uh, history of stroke. So as a team, we, uh, we recommend PFO closure uh, in patients who are less than 60, who have a history of a cortical infarct, who have no other known cause for stroke, who have a high risk echocardiographic, uh, high risk echocardiographic features for their PFO, and who, who have the absence of significant vascular disease in the head and neck. Closure is often considered in, in what we would think of as lower risk patients, but our threshold for recommending closure is significantly higher. So that includes some patients who are over 60 years of age. And again, um, we, for the, that patient population, would uh, mandate at least six months of arrhythmia monitoring to make sure that atrial fibrillation is not uh, present. Um, we um, also look at what was the, uh, what was the um, circumstances of the stroke. So was there a provocative event? Uh, did it occur around the time of um, a Valsalva-like maneuver, lifting of a heavy object? Um, did it occur uh, either during sleep or on waking, which sometimes uh, suggests the, the possibility for sleep apnea related or, or uh, obstructive sleeping, uh, obstructive breathing related paradoxical embolus? Um, did, are there multiple events despite medical therapy? Um, was there a contemporaneous pulmonary embolus or a systemic embolic event to suggest that um, clot, in fact, uh, migrated across? A history of migraine with aura is something that we will sometimes sort of talk about. It doesn't necessarily push the needle one way or the other for us, um, but sometimes uh, that enters our thinking. And is it a patient who has some contraindication to long-term antiplatelet or uh, anticoagulation therapy? So our process, um, the neurologic assessment, again, we look carefully for the uh, stroke topography. Um, is there uh, cerebral vascular disease present? And are there alternative causes or potential risk factors for stroke? The cardiac assessment really focuses on the characteristics of the PFO and the presence of occult atrial fibrillation. And then we have a very uh, detailed discussion with our patients reviewing the current data um, the risks associated with the procedure and the long-term risks of the device, including the potential for long-term arrhythmia, although that risk is low. And we re review uh, with each patient their, their individual potential benefit from closure, which for us is obviously very different when you're talking to a, a 25 or 30-year-old patient with a lifetime um, of potential risk versus a 75-year-old uh, with a shorter period of potential benefit. That's our approach. Um, I wanted to keep it relatively short. So thank you very much. I'm happy to um, take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Esnes. This was an excellent talk. And uh, I, I, you know, the, especially the things that you highlighted about a detailed assessment of a PFO is not just the presence of the PFO that needs to be closed, but a detailed discussion that needs to happen. And for that, I'm just going to open the floor first to our panels for questions. And I'll go to Dr. Saad Shafkat and Dr. Saad Shafkat, before you ask your question, can you also give a neurologist's perspective about the data of PFO closure versus disease versus, um, uh, you know, versus use of anticoagulant? Do I have Dr. Saad online? Yes. Uh, so sorry, uh, my internet is back and forth. So fantastic talk. Thank you, Dr. Asnes. Um, you touched on all the uh, points that we keep uh, going over in our heads and in our daily website. Brand. I have two questions, actually. One is that how sad white persuasive 
uh, how uh, the challenge always is implicating uh, PFO as the embolic source in a particular uh, patient. Uh, so my question is how satisfied are you that we are picking up all PFOs with the quote unquote gold standard of TEE with agitated saline contrast, that's one. And the second is that in your practice, if you find PFO concurrently with another embolic source, such as perhaps a cultivated fibrillation or a tight ipsodactyl carotid, what is the approach? Do you tend to be more conservative in that uh, in that situation? Um, so I think that um, so the answer in answer to your first question, I think that um, the TEE I think is um, very operator dependent. So I think you have to have somebody who really understands uh, what it is that we're trying to demonstrate on the TEE. Um, I've seen a number of cases where um, a TEE is done in a patient who they're evaluating for the potential for a PFO uh, without use of uh, agitated saline contrast, uh, sometimes without um, multiplanar assessment mm -hmm. of the atrial septum to really look for uh, what the anatomy of the atrial septum is. Um, so I think it's uncommon uh, in, in, um, in my practice to miss a PFO, but I would say that I certainly see patients uh, who bring studies to us from elsewhere where operators are not as familiar with what we're looking for, where PFOs can go missed. I think more often um, what we see is we suspect a PFO is there, uh, go to the cath lab and find actually that we can't get across the foramen for one reason or another. Um, and, and that's always very frustrating and actually something that we're looking more into because I think that as the, the referral patterns have increased in the last several years, we've brought more and more patients to the lab. Um, and I think if you, some of the earlier studies, particularly migraine studies had looked at um, what was the incidence of a, of a false positive test for TEE? And it's not, it's not negligible. They're somewhere around four to 5% uh, um, uh, of false positives. So um, trying to do a better job with provocative maneuvers, trying to um, better understand how we can image, uh, I think is critical. Um, and in answer to your second question, I think it really depends um, in, in those patients who have other potential causes. Um, I think it's a careful discussion. You know, we sometimes will see a patient who has uh, a 30% stenotic lesion in the right carotid, but presents uh, with a left-sided embolic event and with no disease in the left. And, and in somebody like that, we may opt for PFO closure because the clinical scenario is such that their, their right-sided atherosclerotic disease had nothing to do with their stroke. Um, and, and what I tell patients, is we're, we're sort of taking a, a belt and suspenders approach. Um, so we'll close the PFO. We're only eliminating one potential cause for stroke. We're not eliminating other potential causes okay. for stroke. And their, their risk of stroke is going to increase through their lifetime. But we know that we can safely close the PFO um, and we can um, eliminate this one potential cause. In those patients, I think you need to have what, what in my mind is a is a high risk PFO. I wouldn't do that uh, in a patient who let's let's take a, a 62 year old with right sided carotid disease and a left sided stroke who has a tiny pinhole PFO with barely any bubbles crossing on an agitated saline injection. I don't think that patient's going to benefit from from the procedure. That same that same scenario, but with a patient with a large uh, atrial septal aneurysm and a large right to left shunt at rest, that patient may benefit. Um, so I think it's a careful conversation with the patient uh, to go over the, the, that. Makes sense, thank you very much. Well, Robert, it, it's, it's- Yeah, I'm gonna go to Dr. Uh, Ali Nasser Zaidi. And Dr. Zaidi, before you ask your question, if you can also comment on, uh, you know, indication of PFO closure in patients who have pulmonary hypertension and right to left shunt across the PFO <laughs> and the history of stroke. <laughs> so that's a that's a that's a very tough question to <laughs> answer in uh, in 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 thirty seconds or so. So so what Bob, Barbara just brought up is the PFO and pulmonary hypertension. That's that's a very tricky um, tricky question, primarily because it's not there's no easy answer to that. Um, I think tomorrow we are we are talking a little bit about pulmonary hypertension and congenital heart disease, and I think we'll 
get into the sort of the granularity of that. Um, the short answer to that is um, it, it's individualized. If you can't really go close a PFO in, uh, in pulmonary hypertension in all patients, it's not, you can't paint all patients with one brush. It's so, it, it is highly, um, hi highly individualized. So it's a great question, but um, it need, I think we'll, we'll, we'll delve into that tomorrow a little bit more when, when we have our pH um, session. Um, but, but but I, just, I, I just want to make a quick comment that that as part of our routine for PFO closure, um, just to that point, we we always measure the right ventricular pressure prior to going across the the atrial septum, because I I always want to know that there's not this is not a patient with pulmonary hypertension before we close, and I think that's a really important point. It, it's rare, um, but we do occasionally see a patient who surprisingly they had no tricuspid regurgitation on their on their echo the septal position was not well assessed or something like that and and it, while rare it, you can see that in, in in those settings i typically will back out i will not close a pfo in a patient with significant pulmonary hypertension um, in, until they've seen uh, the pulmonary hypertension team and, and made some determination about whether medication is necessary or not so, so um, Dr. Asnad, Barbara, if it's okay, if I can just bring up two points, and I think, I know we're, we're running a little late, but I think it's important to highlight two things. One is what Dr. Asnad just, just touched upon is the right heart hemodynamics. I think that's very important to understand before we go into any sort of shunt closure, be it a PFO, certainly an ASD, but we'll, that's, that's one. The second question, and I think I'm seeing some questions pop up about the concept of doing a, just a TE or the bubble study. And, I, and just putting my imaging hat on for a second, is there another test? And the two that come to my mind is one is a transcranial ultrasound, which can sometimes be done when you, when you don't have um, enough evidence that there is a PFO. We get referrals, we think there's a stroke, there's a PFO, but should we be doing transcranial ultrasounds in those patients? So, so that's one. And two is, is there any role of ice um, when you're going in um, to close a device and you can't see it on a TEE? But can ice help um, when, if, you, if you're going in with a catheterization at that stage? So, so it's a two-part question, the role of transcranial ultrasound and the role of ice. Yeah, I think that those are, are good questions. I think the transcranial dopplers or transcranial ultrasound um, is a great screening tool uh, because it, it's relatively non-invasive. Um, and uh, But it doesn't provide the the anatomic definition that you need. And, and you can still be fooled by pulmonary AVM or some other source of, of right to left shunt. So I think it's a good screening tool because you don't want to take every patient to, uh, to TEE. Um, in, in our center where we actually are not using it, um, we're starting a study uh, in the next couple of months looking at sort of simultaneous TEE and transcranial Doppler to start to get a feel for um, how how useful that might be, um, but I'd be concerned that you don't really you don't really have a sense of the the um, the other risk factors of the PFO that that are associated with stroke. Um, the um, I'm sorry, but I forgot the the second ice. piece. Ice. Oh, ice. Yeah. So so our practice um, is all of our PFO closures are done with intracardiac echo. Um, the, the only reason that we do TEE in real time uh, during PFO closure uh, would be a patient who had a need for, for general anesthesia, uh, which is pretty uncommon. Um, but if they have a need for general anesthesia or there's something, I guess the other issue is sometimes we see these very unusual um, atrial anatomies, sometimes with fibrous bands connecting septum primum to septum secundum, um, and we're not sure if a PFO device is really going to adequately sit on the septum. So in those cases where the anatomy is quite complex, um, ICE has its limitations, uh, and so we'll switch over to TEE. Um, but by and large, the, I would say you know 95 or more percent of our PFO closures are done under intracardiac echo. And, and I don't I think it helps in the sense that the patient's not gagging on a <laughs> on the on the TEE probe, um, but sometimes it's it's limiting because um, in rare cases, although I didn't used to think this, and in, in some cases the three dimensional imaging from TEE nowadays is so good that it can really help guide um, where is the hole and why can't I find it, um, and also can be helpful in terms of determining the presence of pulmonary AVMs because we can look for bubbles returning from a pulmonary vein by TEE. 
Uh, Dr. Najib Basir, um, if you can ask your question. And also, before you ask, um, a comment from you about somebody who has atrial fibrillation, has a PFO, and now we stick a device in them and anticoagulation. Okay, uh, that's a very nice uh, presentation, Dr. Asnes. Uh, my question for you is uh, there's a recent uh, publication in June 2020 in which there was a meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials of uh, closed respect, reduce, and defense probe, in which uh, they mentioned a frequency of atrial fibrillation being about 6%, and the frequency of stroke, surprisingly, at two years was 2.4%. Now, that itself makes me a bit worried. Um, in your practice, um, do you anticoagulate your patients or put them on antiplatelets following a PFA closure, uh, you know, keeping this in mind, one stroke itself is bad enough, but 2.4% uh, is a bit worrying. So uh, any comments on that? Second question is, um, what, uh, you know, high risk PFO, you mentioned certain features like uh, uh, atrial septal aneurysm, hypermobility of the septum, long tunnel, there's a mention of uh, presence of eustachian valve at the IBC inlet and uh, Chiari network. So how do these two last two entities come into the uh, uh, setting of uh, high risk PFO? And lastly, if your atrial septum has uh, multiple fenestrations um, and a patient has had a stroke, uh, would that be a contraindication to using an occluded device and would one consider um, atrial septal repair? Um, so let me take those in reverse order. <laughs> so the, the multi-fenestrated atrial septum, we would call a fenestrated ASD. Um, not, so it's not uncommon, I think, that we would see a PFO in the setting of a fenestrated um, atrial septum primum. Um, and in that setting, uh, Sometimes, often the, the referral in that setting is more for the ASD and, and right heart uh, hemodynamics that are um, adversely affected by the ASD as opposed to stroke, but occasionally it's stroke alone. And we do have devices intended specifically for that situation. So the Amplatz or Cribriform device was designed for those fenestrated uh, defects. Um, and the Gore Cardioform device actually does quite well with those as well. So, so that in and of itself wouldn't, wouldn't pose a problem for closure. In terms of the eustachian valve and Chiari network, I find um, that I think they are risk factors. Um, I think that um, if you look, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if you look at um, many of our patients with significant atrial septal aneurysm, they often have concomitant um, large Chiari networks um, and large eustachian valves. Um, I'm I'm not, there, there have been a few publications looking at that as a specific risk factor. I'm not convinced by the data, but I am convinced by, it, it sort of makes sense to me um, from, a, from a physiologic standpoint that the presence of a large eustachian valve um, that directs blood flow from the IVC toward the atrial septum would increase the risk for thrombus being sort of forced up into the PFO, right? The, the eustachian valve itself um, embryologically is designed as a sort of um, flow director. It directs the flow coming back from the umbilical artery toward the, toward the fossa ovalis so that oxygenated blood gets to the fetal brain. And so often, uh, I see this in um, when we have patients undergoing bubble study, bubble studies are typically done from the arm. And sometimes you'll see that the bubble study is read as negative, but the fossa ovalis itself never gets bubbles because there's a large eustachian valve that's directing all the IVC flow at the fossa and washing away the bubbles. And so I've thought for a while it would be much more interesting to do bubble studies from below, since that's where we think most of the thrombi come from anyway. Uh, and especially in patients with large eustachian valves, I think we would probably see uh, a, a large right to left shunt in, in many of these patients directed because the, the eustachian valve directs it. In terms of the Chiari network, I, I don't know what to make of that. Um, I mean, the the when you look at the autopsy, um, data or the autopsy images of some of these QRE networks, they're, they're quite impressive. Um, and it seems that they could 
similarly uh, result in flow changes and allow thrombi to move. They could also seem to me to potentially allow for capture of thrombi um, that could then eventually uh, get across the septum. Um, in terms of the anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy, so our standard regimen um, is uh, for patients who come to us not on anticoagulation, which is the majority, um, we use uh, three months of um, dual antiplatelet therapy post implant. So we use Plavix, uh, Clopidogrel, uh, and aspirin for three months. And after three months, we'll take the Plavix away. And my recommendation to patients is always that they stay on aspirin indefinitely. Um, that's consistent with the reduced trial. And, and I think we don't really know if we're doing the right thing in every patient by closing the PFO. And so I think the addition of aspirin is, is useful. Um, in patients who come to us uh, these days, many will come on, um, on a DOAC or a NOAC, and we will continue that therapy uh, and usually add aspirin um, for the first three months post-procedure. I have not seen um, post PFO closure stroke um, in, with the exception of patients who discontinue their medication um, inappropriately. Now, as a single center, that, that's meaningless, right? I mean, the, clearly there's an incidence of stroke following PFO closure. Um, many years, when I was at the Cleveland Clinic, we, st we studied our population of PFO patients. And, and again, those patients who had post-closure stroke, um, it was generally related to thrombus on the device or atrial fibrillation post-closure. Um, the thrombus on the device was generally in patients who stopped their medications uh, inappropriately. Um, atrial fibrillation post-closure, um, when we see patients who come back to us with either, you know, if they say, you know, I'm having some palpitations, I feel a little lightheaded, whatever, we will uh, monitor those patients, usually a 30-day monitor. If we, we um, in a patient who's on aspirin and Plavix, <clears throat> we will sometimes, if we're quite concerned, we'll change their regimen and add, uh, remove the Plavix and add <clears throat> an anticoagulant um, until we prove that they either do or don't have atrial fibrillation. Um, I think that that 6% number, so in the respect in the reduced trial, it was 6.6% of patients, I think, had AFib post device. And in reduced, it was uh, around 5%. Uh, sorry, in respect, it was around 5%. Um, many of those patients, the, the atrial fibrillation was short lived um, and lasted only for you know, a few weeks. Um, I take those patients very seriously and have, uh, in, in some of them, have gone forward and done a um, implanted monitor and continued them on anticoagulation for at least a year uh, to make sure that they don't have recurrence. Um, and in my experience, most don't. Um, there are some patients who continue to go on to have AFib. Um, I think age plays an important role there. Um, I think that the patients over 60 are at significantly higher risk, um, but they're at higher risk for AFib in general. Perfect. So thank you very much. And this brings us to the end of the session. And um, the take home message again is, it's not whether you can close the PFO, it's but answer the question why the PFO needs to be closed. And with that, I hand it over to Dr. Shahid Sami, who's gonna talk about surgery and gender. Thank you, Bauer. what a lovely evening. Thank you. Uh, We'll change gear, uh, gears here to cardiac surgery, and I'm delighted to present our panelists for this session. General Afshin Akbal is the consultant cardiac surgeon and head of department of cardiac surgery at Armed Forces Institute of Cardiology in Islamabad. Second panelist is Dr. Azam Jan, head of department cardiothoracic and vascular surgery at Rahman Medical Institute in Peshawar. Uh, my third panelist is Dr. Anjum Jalal, Executive Director and Head of Cardiac Surgery at Faisal Abad Institute of Cardiology, and our own Dr. Sayyid Shahabuddin, uh, Associate Professor of Cardiac Surgery and Consultant Cardiothoracic Surgeon at AKU. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, the next uh, presenter, Dr. Hasna Sharif. He is Professor of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery at Aga Khan uh, University. He graduated from Law Medical College and won the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship to University of Oxford. 
He subsequently subsequently trained in general and cardiovascular surgery at the University of London, Manchester, and Oxford, and moved to USA for his fellowship at the University of Massachusetts. He was on faculty at Harvard Medical School before returning to Pakistan and joining at the Aga Khan University in the year 2000 as an assistant professor. He has published extensively on outcomes and risk stratification in cardiovascular surgery in Pakistan. He has been instrumental in getting a cardiac fellowship training program accredited by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Pakistan at Aga Khan Hospital. In addition to his uh, clinical research, he has a keen interest in advancing the stem cell research program at the university. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my pleasure to invite him to present on the sex differences in survival after cardiac surgery. Dr. Snath Sharif. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's indeed an honor and a pleasure to be addressing this august audience. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sami, for the very kind introduction. Uh, the topic given to me was uh, exactly the way I've put it up on the slide, sex differences in survival after cardiac surgery. Um, I have uh, no conflicts to report. And the first thing that, I, that came to my mind when Usman talked to me about the topic was uh, this old book uh, that we all are aware of, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Uh, that's a controversial and contentious uh, topic, but maybe uh, cardiac surgery and outcomes may have uh, may throw some light on this. So uh, before we move into the uh, body of the talk itself, a little bit about the historical perspective, uh, cardiac surgical procedures really started in the last century. Before that, it was taboo uh, to touch the heart. And uh, the name of John Gibbon is synonymous with uh, transic in, in the field of cardiology because he is the person who uh, developed and invented the heart-lung machine in 1953 with uh, IBM. Now, of all uh, the cardiac surgical procedures that are done, cabbage is the most commonly performed procedure, and that's the index surgery. And for, for the purposes of this talk, I will mainly talk about cabbage, whether that is, and as we know, that it can be done on the beating heart or on pump, and that's the pump of John Gibbon. Very early in the uh, development of cardiac surgery, cardiac surgeons, the pioneers, were very uh, much uh, into developing a database because they knew perhaps that they'd be looked upon very uh, uh, carefully. Uh, so they uh, had databases and from the databases, they were able to uh, make risk calculators or predictors for outcomes. And these predictors, if you look at them, the but the more important ones are advancing age, female gender, equity or presentation, impaired LV ejection fraction, the presence of associated comorbidities, the frailty or obesity, obesity of an individual, and a poor functional class. These are all predictors of adverse outcomes. We also know uh, that in women, unfortunately, their symptoms may be atypical, they tend to downplay or conceal or indeed ignore their symptoms and hence present late. They may be referred late by the GP or internist or even the cardiologist. And as a consequence, when they present their older, they need urgent emergent operations and they have greater associated comorbidity. So with that, um, this is a meta-analysis uh, that was published uh, in the American Journal of Cardiology in 2013. That's a huge uh, data set. It's about a million patients. And if you look at it, more than two thirds of uh, the patients operated upon were males and less than one third were patients. So there's a, there's a bias there uh, for whatever reason, uh, but it's, it exists. And from the meta-analysis, what they found out was that the mortality was twice as high as compared to, in women as compared to men. And this increased mortality trend is maintained across all age groups. It is uh, maintained across short-term, mid-term, and long-term, and it is irrespective of the equity of the presentation. 
some of the hypotheses uh, for the poor outcomes in women are that they have a smaller uh, body surface area. And if you have a BSA of less than 1.6 meters squared, you are five times more likely to die compared to somebody with a BSA of more than two meter per square. Uh, women may have smaller coronary arteries, greater chances of graft occlusion. And the last point is fairly surprising, but women uh, were most li were more likely or less likely to receive a, a left internal mammary artery graft to the LAD. So with that background, uh, we thought we'd look at uh, what the data uh, is from our own centers. And this is a study for, so I, before I go on to that, Another thing is that South Asian ethnicity is an independent risk factor for an adverse outcome after open heart surgery. And that's something that's been reported over and over again. In the new STS risk calculators, they uh, look upon ethnicity and uh, you get a score for being South Asian. So this is a study uh, came out of AKU and Dr. Sami and Dr. Shahab who are here with us today, uh, were authors on this study. And this was uh, published in the 2016 in the Annals of Medicine and Surgery. So it's a fairly modest uh, number compared to the million that I talked about. So about 2,000 patients from AKU. Uh, but what is so surprising over here or striking is that females are even less represented in our population and they will, are less likely to get an operation. However, the mortality in males uh, compared to the STS uh, surprisingly is less. However, the mortality in women continues to be high and in the same range as the STS database. The other thing from our own institutional uh, data, we were interested to look at the internal memory use and uh, the good thing was that our internal memory use was fairly high. And in, if anything, it was slightly more in the, in the, uh, in the women than in, in the men. However, women were older as we talked about earlier and were more likely to have hypertension and diabetes mellitus. On a univariate and multivariate analysis, mortality in our uh, cohort was associated with female gender, presence of renal insufficiency, and a prolonged aortic cross clamp time. And morbidity on univariate and multivariate analysis was associated with advanced age, presence of renal insufficiency, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So uh, the conclusion from the institutional report, and this is really going to be a very short presentation, uh, that even after adjusting for risk factors, women undergoing cabbage indeed have a higher risk of operative mortality. And that's in line with what John was talking about, about the TAVR and SAVR data. Uh, the limitations for this study, are, we had a very small number. It's obviously a retrospective design. This was retrospective analysis of a prospectively collected data. Because the set were, data set was small, we could not apply propensity score analysis. So once institutional report, uh, short-term outcomes were only seen, and unfortunately it did not include all comers. So does that explain it? Uh, I don't know. I think the jury is out. Perhaps, uh, as we operate more on women, maybe the outcomes may get better. And I think we become a victim of our own success. If you look at our outcomes, 0.6% mortality in men makes the 3.9% mortality look bad for women. Uh, but as time goes by, and perhaps if we can add more numbers to it, maybe the male mortality might go up, I don't know, but hopefully the female mortality might come down. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think because we're running late, it will be nice to have questions and have an interactive session at this stage. Thank you, Dr. Snap. Uh, I would like uh, any questions first uh, from our panelists. Uh, I noticed that uh, Dr. Afshin Iqbal is not here. So I'll start with Dr. Azam Jan. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Asna. Can you hear me? Alaikum Sam. Yes, I do. This is an uh, excellent presentation, and uh, as Dr. Sami and the rest of the faculty. Uh, my first question is uh, Do you think anything can be done to change this outcome in terms of uh, female mortality, uh, meaning choice of graphs, uh, arterial graphs, et cetera, for smaller vessels? 
or uh, anything that's modifiable in your experience? Well, I think uh, if the vessel size is small, uh, you will have issues. Um, I, I think it's an interesting point that we were to use more. It's always been said that if one gra arterial graft is good, more might be better. Uh, but I think the jury is out. I don't really have an answer to that. Perhaps Dr. Semi or uh, Dr. Anjum might have insight into it. Um, I'll reserve my comments uh, till the end. May I ask uh, Dr. Anjum for his comments? Dr. Anjum Jalal. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Well, thank you very much for asking me to be part of the panel. It's uh, interesting talk by uh, Dr. Hasnaf. Uh, let me tell you something interesting. Uh, we have a database of uh, online database, which uh, mm, uh, I mean, the four major units are participating data in that. Multan Institute of Cardiology, Faisalabad, Rawalpindi, and AFIC. And at present, the total number of patients there are uh, 35,000. 353, out of which only 9,353 are female patients, which means the female population here, which undergoes uh, cardiac surgery, is uh, uh, one fourth of the total population, uh, which uh, simply means that there is either some degree of bias and the clinicians are not referring enough females uh, they may have uh, a wrong impression that probably they have poor results, which is not supported by our actual results. There is a very, very non-significant difference between mortality, although uh, our figures from database show that their hospital stay is slightly prolonged and the uh, incidence of uh, wound infection is slightly higher. And that is related to their smaller body size with uh, relatively higher BMI. So these are the things which we have noticed and uh, I hope one day we will be able to publish all these, uh, the, the, these uh, figures. Uh, about the coronary size and uh, the rest of risk factors, we have not noticed much difference uh, as a matter of fact. And when we actually do the uh, graft flow studies, there is hardly any difference between male and female patients. So uh, I think either the uh, disease incidence is uh, lower in female population, they are protected before in their reproductive ages, uh, they are protected against coronary artery disease. And that's probably the reason, one reason that there are much lesser number of female patients in all the studies reported. And the second thing is there may be uh, some degree of bias amongst the clinicians that they are not referred uh, in the same numbers as the male patients. Dr. Shai. Thank you. Uh, those are very relevant uh, comments. May I ask Dr. Sayyid Shahabuddin to, for his comment? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum all. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation and being author of the, this paper. Uh, we were feeling that probably the risk factor that are more in, pa in female patients like diabetes and hypertension, they were more in, uh, in these in female patients and they may be attributing to this. But um, when these were sub subject to sub-analysis, it was found that the female patient and the sex itself is an independent uh, risk factor for, for a poor outcome. However, the, the other thing with about, about the referral, I think probably because of the socioeconomic uh, setup is such that the female, female uh, population is not supported by, the, uh, by the, the male partners in most of the family. This is obviously, I don't have any, uh, any data or any uh, specific uh, research on that, but this is just subjective and probably uh, what has been uh, discussed uh, often is, is, is one of the factor and because they pay less for these patients because irrespective of their, uh, their uh, comorbids, they are at a higher risk. 
and one of the study have seen this in the size of the vessels but that was seen at the higher level at the left main and in the led and they found that there were the different in the sizes but obviously they looked at the very proximal end of the vessels and that was also a very in a, in a small population so it cannot be generalized as dr anjum jalal said so it's a mystery but i would probably i think i have uh, from the literature some people suggest that the re, the doing a off pump cavage in female patient may minimize some of the poor outcome as uh, the majority of the study suggests that their uh, short term outcomes are poor and as in in tavi they probably the long term survival or their uh, later uh, later outcome is better as compared to the immediate or short term uh, short term outcome so maybe in off pump uh, surgery may be uh, considered obviously there are chances that we may apply some less number of grafts in those patient but that will minimize the uh, effect of uh, um, cardiopulmonary bypass on the uh, low bsa thank you thank you very much um, any other question before uh, i give my comments that uh, we i have authored another paper and we found that particularly in this part of the world the female when they have heart disease they present very late they are sitting at home suffering and because at times they don't have anybody to bring them to hospital uh, by the time they come their rejection fraction is low uh the same happens with their diabetes that it is poorly managed and we all have to look at uh, these factors any questions well if there are no questions uh, may i um, thank you all for uh, listening to this session and uh, hand over to dr amba malik for next presentation dr amba actually before we uh, uh dr carlos has yes. some uh, clinical commitments so he needs a little bit of time so we're going to move ahead with the talk by dr jepta curtis so i'll i'll go ahead and introduce him and bring him on um so we are truly uh, fortunate today to have with us dr jepta curtis he is an associate professor uh, of medicine in the department of cardiology at yale uh school of medicine um he's the medical director of uh, performance improvement in the heart and vascular center he's also a senior scientific advisor for the acc's ncdr uh, reg registry uh he's a director of the registry data analytics center at the center for outcomes research and evaluation dr curtis uh, got his medical degree from columbia college of physicians and surgeons uh, before training in internal medicine at duke and completing his fellowships in clinical and interventional cardiology at Yale he's published extensively over uh, 2000 publications and is invited to speak both nationally and internationally uh, at present um he uh, he also actually led the development of uh, the cms's 30 day mortality uh, registry based outcomes for percutaneous intervention and implantable cardiovascular defibrillators um and currently oversees that registry and its uh, and its uh, quality and research output so we're very very fortunate and honored to have him with us today um the panel for this uh for his talk is um again we're uh, one of our own dr salim virani you know, he's been a huge supporter he's an aq alum uh, he's a professor in the section of of cardiology and cardiovascular research at baylor he is the chair of the prevention of cardiovascular disease council uh, for the american college of cardiology and a member of the ncdr management uh, board for acc dr asa patan chief of cardiology at thaba dr bashir hanif uh, executive medical medical director at thaba dr nadeem rizvi uh, professor and director of the cardiac cath lab at nicvd dr tahir sarir professor and interventional cardiologist at nicvd uh and dr hasan zafar associate professor and chief quality and patient safety officer at uh, aqh uh, and consultant general surgeon we we chose this panel because both the uh, heart institute and icvd and aqu are actively involved in the ncdr's cath pci registry dr javed tai who couldn't be with us today unfortunately due to some health reasons um oversees that registry and we were trying to engage this discussion um 
with uh, with Jetta stock so we can explore how to best um, how to optimize output both clinical and research uh, from our participation in these registries. So uh, looking forward to a good discussion and over to you, Jepta. Thank you so much. Um, a, a moderate correction that I, I have published, I think extensively, but it's more in the order of 220 publications, not 2000. Uh, but I appreciate for promotion purposes, the, uh, the inflation. Um, so my great pleasure to, to, to join you guys today from across the ocean. It's um, just a, a lovely to, uh, opportunity to, to reconnect uh, with Osman, who was a spectacular fellow with us at Yale for two years. Um, so he asked us to, or asked me to talk a little bit about um, how we use NCDR data for quality improvement in the cath lab. And, and the other part of the talk, um, which would be sort of the segue to research, I'm going to sort of minimize, but we can certainly talk about that uh, because there are, as, as you can judge from the peer reviewed literature, lots of papers that can come out of, of registry data. And uh, Dr. Varani is also you know, very well published out of the suite of registries from the NCDR. Um, but I'm going to focus mainly on sort of the quality improvement. How do we actually take this data from the NCDR locally and translate that into actual quality improvement? So I attribute this quote to, to Ralph Brindis, uh, who was former president of the American College of Cardiology. He says he didn't say it, but, but I'm going to credit to him anyway. Um, he always says, science tells us what can be done, guidelines what we should do, registries what we are actually doing. And I think that really highlights the complementary roles of all the different functions of, of, uh, of how we approach the delivery of medicine and, and improving uh, the quality of care. Really, you know, we do need the science. We need the randomized trials to tell us what can be done, what should be done. The guidelines synthesize that for us, but the registries show us, are we actually doing it? Are we translating that information into practice? So the NCDR, uh, the National Cardiovascular Data Registries, um, have a specific goal, which is that through the capture and reporting of reliable data, the NCDR helps participants measure, benchmark, and improve cardiovascular care. Do this. By, uh, to inform quality improvement at the provider and institutional level, to evaluation of practice patterns, and to promote effective disseminate best practices, and improve patient care worldwide. And this is really remains the core mission of the NCDR, uh, which is a sort of a, a smaller corporation that sits within the larger umbrella of the American College of Cardiology. Uh, as way of background, the NCDR has a suite of registries. It started with CAF PCI in 1998, which is really the foundation and, and still, I think, the, the heart and soul of the NCDR. Um, but over the years, we've added different modules, uh, including the ICD registry, uh, the action registry, now called the chest pain MI registry for, for myocardial infarction, and the TB registry, among others. So uh, the breadth of the registry has only increased over time. Again, to reiterate why we do this, why does the in these registries? Well, certainly there's unique clinical information uh, that allows uh, performance measurement, that supports, and uh, ideally will in the future allow scale delivery registry-driven quality improvement programs to a greater degree than what we do now. And it seems to be frozen. There we go. Um, the key of any registry is, is to have faith in the quality of the data. So the NCDR invests heavily in data quality. Um, through training and clinical support of the data abstractors, um, through automated uh, IT infrastructure that allows us to real-time assess the integrity of the data, uh, as well as the completeness of the data. And then, and this is fairly unique to, to the NCDR, um, they invest heavily in data accuracy as assessed by audits. So we don't audit every hospital every year, but 10% of hospitals are audited and then a sample of their cases are uh, reviewed remotely. It doesn't require on-site review, but it does require uh, access to the medical record. So what does the output from the registry look like? So the NCDR CAT PCI registry, among others, uh, provides on a quarterly basis benchmark reports to sites that are participating that allow them to assess their performance on a wide range of measures, but also hone call our executive measure set consists of those key drivers and modifiable risks uh, for patients undergoing PCI. So for each of these, uh, you get your benchmark report, 
Um, and for each measure, you have a hospital can assess where they stand with respect to the national average, as well as to top performers. So for this particular metric, which was the uh, prescription of ACE or ARB for patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, you can see that this hospital uh, was actually 78%, um, uh, whereas they were close to the national 50, 50th percent or the median performance of hospitals, but lagging behind hospitals in the 90th percentile. So this is ideally uh, the way that, that hospitals would look at this data and use it to identify how opportunities for improvement. So the registry has been wildly successful beyond what, what the ACC really ever envisioned. Um, within the United States and increasingly across the world, uh, hospitals that perform these procedures are submitting their data with the, with the goal of getting these benchmark reports and improving their, their quality. Um, in the United States, we have more than 1,700 hospitals actively participating. We've collected records on over uh, 18 million uh, patients over uh, this 20-year period of time. And it really is an unparalleled resource for quality improvement as well as research. So really the idea here is that through NCDR participation, you will get your benchmark reports. You'll see, be able to access your online dashboards and use that to identify areas for improvement, develop a quality improvement plan from that, and then implement that plan. Make changes and then go back in this continuous circle of quality improvement, uh, such that you're always working to improve. Question we posed a few years ago was whether or not this is actually taking place. So we conducted a survey of uh, about half of hospitals participating in the CAP PCI registry. And amongst the questions that we asked, we said, were data from the registry being reviewed at face-to-face -face forums and meetings? Now, face-to-face -face has a different context now in, in COVID, but, but you know, through Zoom, we still maintain our meetings locally. But we asked other hospitals, are they doing it? And if so, who is, uh, is reviewing this data? Um, so, you know, it was nice to see that, that um, the majority, two-thirds of hospitals had reported that they had uh, data review at multidisciplinary meetings. Um, and that most of these uh, meetings, physicians were present, uh, who I think are important clinical champions for this type of work. But at 8% of hospitals, uh, the, the data had not been reported that it was actually reviewed on a regular basis, which is pretty disturbing. We also asked, did hospitals use data to support specific local quality improvement initiatives? And again, it's a glass half empty or half full. 83% of hospitals that responded said that they had used this data for specific quality improvement initiatives. But 16% had said uh, that they did not. So it begs the question, if you're investing this time and energy in getting this data and submitting it and getting the benchmark reports, which is a substantial financial investment, how could you not be doing anything with that data? And so it, it really suggests that for some hospitals, at least, there's a, 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 a break in this circle of quality improvement, um, so that you get the data but the, you're missing this, the active step to then take that data and translate it into actual improvements. So I wanna spend um, the rest of this talk talking about what we do at YNHH and something a little bit about um, how we're implementing best practices from a wide range of studies that we've conducted over the years that identify how top performing hospitals uh, work and use data to improve care. So I'd like to say, and I'm proud to say, that we have used the data in a systematic way to assess a number of different issues that, that we face in the cath lab. So we started, like everybody, uh, focusing on door to balloon times or the timeliness of reperfusion therapy. Uh, but we pivoted, we springboarded from those successes to say, okay, where else can we apply these techniques and where else can we see success? So by now, after about 10 years of doing this, we have more than 10 uh, quality improvement initiatives that have resulted from our participation in the CAP PCI registry. So door to balloon, radial access, antithrombotic choice, uh, focusing on bleeding and acute kidney injury uh, outcomes, uh, helping us learn how to do better do same day discharge and identify opportunities for that. Uh, so across a breadth of outcomes and process of care measures, uh, we've really been implementing uh, and using the data to do better care. So where, where does our approach come from? It comes from our studies, as I mentioned, of high-performing organizations. And we've conducted uh, four NIH-funded studies over the years, uh, looking at different aspects of, of care of cardiovascular patients. And uh, these were mixed-method studies with qualitative and quantitative components. What was interesting is that around the fourth study, we really reached saturation. 
such that we pretty well could characterize those features of, of high performing organizations that we think are strongly associated with their ability to deliver consistent high quality care. So it kind of fell into seven buckets. Um, one, you have to have broad expertise. Two, uncompromising leadership. Three, setting explicit goals with visible administrative support. Developing innovative protocols, providing data in a timely fashion, and perhaps most importantly, having as a characteristic of the organization, flexibility and persistence to allow you to, to overcome obstacles. What I wanna do is walk through for a few minutes how at Yale New Haven Hospital, each of these has been brought to bear. So for broad expertise, we know hospitals are complex systems. We know that expertise, knowledge, and ideas come from all over the place. It's not a top-down organization. It's not our, our cath lab directors who are telling us exactly what to do. We seek knowledge and input from across the spectrum. Our physicians, yes, but also nurses, techs, and performance improvement staff. And what's in, sort of uh, in the bottom of that is that there has to be a mutual respect and we have to be generous with credit for others uh, so that they continue to work with us and continue, continue to share their ideas with us. For uncompromising leadership, you have to have go-to people. They have to be people that you know that you can count on to do what they're uh, say that they're going to do. Who are willing to make a commitment? At my organization, uh, for for decades, uh, this was uh, our head of clinical cardiology, Henry Cabin, and our uh, former director of the cath lab, Mike Clement. I knew as director of performance improvement that I could go to them with problems, and they would help me solve those problems, and that they would provide the clear vision for us to go forward and improve care. Second, explicit, or third, explicit, uh, setting explicit goals. Um, again, it's a lot of this is about selection and about uh, garnering uh, momentum through success. So we set our explicit goals every year. We set up a PI plan, a performance improvement plan that, uh, that stands across the system and that we are accountable for at the end of the day to our hospital administrators. Uh, so we look at our data, we identify those opportunities, and we select what we think is the lowest hanging fruit that's aligned with our mission of improving care, but also achievable. We then set up a charter with directly responsible individuals identified uh, that allows us to have accountability at the end of the project. And we set, in general, try to set uh, very rapid time frames so that we like to have 90 days from charter signing to implementation of the quality improvement activity. Fourth, visible administrative support. You need the suits. Suits, I don't know if this, this uh, is present in Pakistan, but we've got lots of people, business people, non-clinician running around in very expensive suits who control the purse strings. And you need to in, uh, integrate and partner with these people. Um, you have to speak the language of business. You have to be able to make a business case uh, that there's gonna garner uh, actual economic benefits uh, from quality improvement. Um, and then they help you with the accountability and they help you with the resourcing on the back end. And then data feedback. So benchmark reports from the NCDR are, are great, they're useful, um, but they're not sufficient. So they generally are delayed and only come out quarterly. Quality improvement on the other hand needs to be on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis that you can track your performance. So we partner with our IT teams. Uh, to create automated, automatic reports that allow us to track progress very uh, granularly. And then finally, um, selectively, it's reasonable to, to try to get personal, to identify individuals within your organization uh, who have the, the greatest opportunity to make changes. One example of this that we used um, was in trying to drive down the use of bivalorudin. Our spend on bivalorudin was about $200,000 a year. Uh, sorry, a uh, month, um, which uh, was quite expensive, one of the highest spends in the hospital. And we were using it indiscriminately. We were using it in patients actually at low risk of, of bleeding complications. And so we decided to tackle that. Um, what I'm showing here on the screen is that for the first eight months of this project, we didn't see any change. But at month eight, we started to give feedback reports to individual uh, uh, operators. And what we saw immediately after that was a, a rapid change in behavior. So you need to be careful with this because it, it can have uh, unintended consequences, but when used selectively and appropriately, it can really accelerate quality improvement projects. 
And then finally, flexibility and persistence. Um, anytime you're doing quality improvement, there are going to be bumps in the road. There's going to be unintended consequences. There are going to be naysayers. And you really need to be prepared to address those issues going forward. And uh, to, to overcome that, to maintain that flexibility and persistence, you have to know that you're on the righteous path, that you're doing this for the right reasons, that you've got the right team assembled, and that you've implemented the right approach. And if you have the righteous path, as I call it, you're going to be successful. So I'll just end with sort of another example of, of a quality improvement project uh, that we did quite a, a few years ago, but it's sort of the, the rapidity of the changes was pretty striking. So um, a few years ago in 2013, uh, 2012, uh, the NCDR started reporting appropriate use uh, for uh, performance uh, for patients undergoing PCIs, both for stable and unstable coronary syndromes. Um, and what we found is initially when they started reporting it, we were fine. We were right around the 50th percentile. So we really didn't worry about it. What happened though is over time, our performance degraded. So uh, in 2014, suddenly our performance on this metric was looking very bad indeed. So we're down around the, the 10th to 20th percentile for the registry. And that caught our attention on our, on our monthly reviews. So we started to really worry when we had a couple, like two or three points on the curve where we were starting to, to show that we were not performing up, up to snuff. Uh, so we implemented all the strategies that I just mentioned and uh, had a, a multi-tiered approach, um, but mainly focusing on documentation, uh, education of our referring physicians, and trying to minimize the, uh, the, the un sort of unintentional uh, rewards of doing potentially inappropriate PCIs. Um, we really managed to make a change very rapidly so that over a six month period of time, our appropriate or the proportion of patients in stable PCI uh, who, who were characterized as inappropriate or rarely appropriate went from 24% down to 9%. So you can make real changes very quickly if you put your mind to it. So I'll conclude by saying, you know, CAT PCI registry is necessary for quality improvement, but it's not sufficient. I'd say if you're going to tackle quality improvement, particularly in the early setting, don't bite off too much too soon. Uh, try and go for that low-hanging fruit and ensure that the, comp that the team is going to garner success by having achievable uh, goals. Um, it is certainly a team effort, and it's definitely not rocket science. This is really about attention to detail and setting goals and following up on them with some level of accountability, but it's not terribly complex. So uh, I'll end with, we should all be thinking quality all the time. It is a never ending process and needs to be embedded in our day-to-day -day activities. Um, CAF PCI registry, I think can be an accelerant for that and really support it, uh, but it's really up to the local teams to implement it. So thank you all to all for your attention, appreciate it. Thank you, Jephthah. That's a fantastic, uh, you know, really perfect overview of, uh, uh, of the topic. Um, Salim, do you have any questions or comment? Um, you know, you've, as Jephthah mentioned, you've been extensively involved with ACC registries. I think, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Curtis, fabulous talk. Uh, just because how practical it was, you know, rather than going into any numbers, what practically has been done and how one can take it and implement QI. So, so thank you. This was, and actually very relevant to uh, to Pakistan, uh, Pakistani context as well. I think uh, one question I had for you was, and then that might be important for us as, as, as these QI projects are brought to Pakistan is that in terms of attribution, I think there's a fine balance when these reports are produced at the institutional level versus individual operators. Uh, what have been some of the lessons learned when you take these reports at the individual level? Because it does Take, provide the data at that granular level where QI can happen at an individual clinician level, but then at the same time, one has to be careful how that, that information is conveyed to individual clinicians. So what are some of the best practices that we have learned in US that we could contextualize, but definitely take it back to the clinicians in, US, in, in Pakistan as well? Uh, so that was one question I had. Yeah, I, I think that's a very important point and, and needs to be reinforced, right? It is very easy to take these metrics and break them down by individuals. And 
Um, there are kind of two problems with that. Number one, you start to get into the issues of small numbers, right? So I don't know what the average procedural volume is in, in Pakistan, but in the United States, it's probably around 50. Uh, so you can, you know, 50 per year, and you can get, uh, make very uh, incorrect inferences about quality of an individual with such a small sample. So as you said, I think the key is contextualization. You need to look at that data before you share it with the individual and be able to contextualize it with them. That takes time and that takes effort. Um, it's very easy for a hospital administrator to do that sort of willy-nilly and really uh, get people's backs up and make them really stop listening immediately. If you come at them and you're like, you're not doing great, um, they're not gonna stop, they're not gonna listen to you after those words leave your, your lips. You have to be able to break it to them and partner with them as opposed to commanding them. Dr. Bashir, what's been your experience? I, I know you uh, have been, and, I, and I'm and i gonna welcome Dr. Nadeem Rizvi, who's joined us as well, but, and we'll get um, get to Dr. Nadeem, but Dr. Bashir, what's been your uh, experience uh, of the bus participation in, in the registry so far? Uh, thank you, Usman. Um, uh, excellent, really excellent insight into uh, the NCDR and its value in terms of improving quality. Um, actually, when I moved back from US in 2004, I started trying to get uh, NCDR in Pakistan. It was very difficult at that time. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of other financial economic issues and the cost of NCDR was very high. We kept trying and eventually we were able to get in Pakistan and through Pakistan Cardiac Society. And uh, we were the first uh, institute who became part of NCDR and we have been submitting the data. It definitely, when we started receiving the reports, it was very helpful uh, in terms of uh, improving our qualities. We had, we found whatever issues were there from the report and we started really, um, Dr. Asad Patan was looking into it and we started really um, uh, trying to see where we can improve on those things. And it definitely did help us uh, to really point our shortcomings and how to improve on that. And um, actually really by looking at that, then we try to start our own database in Pakistan, Cardiac Registry of Pakistan. And we are trying to get more and more institutes involved. Uh, currently, as you pointed out earlier, it's only three institutes which have been part of it. And uh, obviously it's kind of a little bit difficult because our um, uh, circumstances are different as compared to USA uh, in terms of primary PCI and other uh, things as well. So I think uh, NCDR also gives you a uh, comparison in terms of the local data versus the US data. Uh, I had actually one uh, quick question, uh, maybe Salim, because he's looking after the international NCDR part. Uh, the, the most important thing, as uh, uh, mentioned earlier too, is the quality of data, uh, which is the most important thing. And uh, I know they are uh, auditing 10% of the data in US. Are they doing like international centers also the quality of data? Because I think that really is very, very important uh, when it comes to basically overall having the reports local versus uh, comparing it to the US. Yeah, well, uh, great question. And, and Dr. Curtis, please chime in as well. I know Dr. Curtis has also been involved in quite a few of those discussions. Uh, you know, the, the international efforts that I've been part of mostly in East Africa and some, are, some in South Africa that are starting now. And then of course, some discussions with Usman and others at AKU with, you know, trying to get involved. And now with, with all the stuff that's been done by pa Pakistan Cardiac Society, uh, I think there is there are discussions about chart reviews the other thing that's happening now is that, which is a separate issue in low to middle income countries is that a lot of uh, places don't even have EMRs. I mean, in US, of course, a lot of it is abst chart abstraction as well, but then there's a lot of stuff that can be taken out from EMR, but here we don't have those. Uh, so right now, those discussions are happening uh, that how do we basically do chart abstraction at least for a random sample every, few years, uh, but the issue that I think we're encountering is the, the burden, as is in low to middle income, income countries, there's even more burden to actually have people who extract the data. Now, if you go back again and do a, a random audit of charts as well, first is how do you get the personnel there and then uh, the, the, the burden associated with that. So those have been some of the issues. Uh, I do believe that things are moving in that direction though. Uh, I think we'll have to just wait a little bit because 
Uh, ACC has been in this space for a few years, but I think numbers wise, of course, still the, the, the number of sites we have, for example, for a registry like CAS PCI is much, much more than what we have on the, on the international sites. So uh, I don't know, Dr. Curtis, if you wanted to add something to that. I think that states it well. I mean, there's issues of, of data governance um, that get more complex as you go internationally. And I think that's been a little bit of a sticking point. Um, the, the challenges associated with, with it getting abstraction reliably um, from paper records is, is definitely a challenge. Um, but one that, that I think may be addressed, there's definitely some talk, and I, I don't know exactly what the timeline would be, of creating sort of lighter registries. Um, so decreasing the, the data collection burden, and making it more feasible for a larger proportion of, of international sites to participate across the world, which ideally is, I think, the goal here. I mean, there's lots of competition in this space from the European registries and, and uh, Pacific Rim, um, but the, the closer we, and, and we don't all have to be on the same platform, uh, but ultimately, if we're on a similar platform, so we can actually generalize that that knowledge, um, that that's sort of a, a goal, a far-reaching goal. Dr. Rizvi, um, what has been your experience at NICBD of uh, the role of uh, CAT PCI in quality outcomes? And and we saw that uh, Jephtha presented some data that about seventy-eight percent of programs were sharing the CAT PCI data with the with their cardiologists and interventional cardiologists. Do you have quarterly meetings? Do you share the reports with with the cardiologists at NICBD? How does how does it uh, figure into your workflow? So I think. <clears throat> We are unique in a, in a unique in a unique position, and uh, I think, uh, as Dr. Curtis and others mentioned, the problem with uh, us is that we are a public sector, very high volume center. So we have to balance our uh, service needs with research, and research has never been a, st a strong point in public sector hospitals in Pakistan. Quality research and quality data. In 2017, we decided to get on this pathway, and we started our CATH registry. Now you. We had CAT PCI and uh, Action Registry, initially now called Chest Pain MI. Now you can well imagine, uh, as uh, someone was mentioning, our volumes on average per day is between 25 to 30 acute MIs a day. I mean, these are acute MIs, T elevation MIs. So we do about 30 primaries a day. Um, so in the last three years, we've done around 26,000 patients. So, so, hello, can you hear me? All right. So yeah. the problem is that the, the 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 personnel who put in the data on the NCDRR are fellows. And we have around twenty six uh, post fellows and a similar number of post graduates. The issue is that the quality is clearly <clears throat> not up to the standard when you go over these uh, data. And the, the 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 coordinator in our case is the doctor who is dedicated with NCDR. And she keeps on complaining about missing certain things. The, the symptom to do balloon time is not available in most cases. The follow-ups are not available. And so, so we have problems in data. So I think the solution in my view over the last three years experience in a very high volume center is that uh, you need to have a separate research department, which we do, but it has to be, uh, the quality has to be maintained by people who are experts. You can't learn on the job. And unfortunately, in a public sector hospital at like NICVD, the priority is not, uh, uh, in my view, uh, uh, it's not the research like in Aga Khan. There's a whole administrative setup, quality orientation thing. In our institute, it's service delivery. So I think that's where we lack. We got in the hospital solutions, the Medtronic Hospital to IHSS guys, they set up various protocols. But again, because of such a high volume and service needs, uh, these things tend to uh, get on the site. So I don't know what the solution is. I suppose the experts will tell us because we are a third world country, uh, service oriented, not much resources for research and data, but we are uh, persisting with the NCDR. Jatta, do you I see that in the comment. US? Um, that the really high volume centers have challenges maintaining quality, um, you know, um, is that has that been the experience? I mean, I, I certainly it's a challenge for any organization, um, regardless of its size. You know that it's it's just a matter of scale. Um, I think that the 
the journey that you guys have been on that you're describing is similar to, to what we had. We didn't start participating in the CAF PCI registry until about 2009. And the first two to three years of our involvement really had very little to do with quality improvement. It really just had to do with data, uh, improving our data quality and, and putting into place those processes that allowed us to be confident about the quality of the data that we were submitting, uh, which we were very much committed to. I think, um, as you noted, we do have a separate team uh, that the hospital system invests in to make sure that this quality of data is, is up to snuff. Um, and so that's definitely say that, that that sort of comes into where those two aspects of quality improvement that I've referred to in my talk was sort of administrative support and being able to, to speak to administrative leaders and make that case to them. I would argue that you can't be a high achieving uh, unless you've got the data to back it up, right? It doesn't have to be NCDR, but you have a form of registry that allows you to really know what you're doing and how you're doing it. And if you don't have that, uh, you're never going to go anywhere. So making that case to the, to the, uh, to the business office is important. Identifying sort of the win-win situations. And so when we talked about that, um, or when I talked about uh, trying to reduce the bivalerin use, that was a win for the administration, right? They went from 200,000 a month for bivalerin down to, I think, probably less than 20,000 a month. That was an enormous win and, and justified for us the use of this or the investment in that registry. And so it doesn't all have to be about quality improvement or it can be, you can, you can couch efficiency and value as being part of quality improvement. Um, and make the administrators happy and, and hopefully incentivize them to make those investments that you need to make. That's a perfect segue to, uh, so we have Dr. Hasnan Zafar with us, uh, who is the uh, chief quality officer uh, at our Khan University at our hospital. And so um, maybe uh, Dr. Hasnan, I could have you um, give your thoughts on institutionally, uh, do, you, you know, do you envision that there's uh, you know, support for such projects uh, where you, you're part of multinational registries and how uh, the institution views it, how uh, the, the quality office views um, our role in this. Oh, I think we lost him. Scared him away. <laughs> All right, so I think, um, Oh, Osman, I'm back. Uh, okay. Sorry for the interruption. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Yeah. So the uh, institution is all for outcomes. Um, and listening to your talk uh, was very uh, informative for me. Uh, there are a few things. Uh, for example, we are in one of the registry, which is a, a surgical registry. And we found that it is useful if we have a consortium of countries outside of United States. So now we are comparing our results with US data and with Middle East data also, because sometimes uh, we find that it is a little uh, demoralizing to, uh, to be compared to a first world situation because not only the hospitals are different, but the patients are different and the timings are different. Second is it is absolutely essential to have these outcomes data because this leads to quality improvement. And we are finding out, uh, uh, we have, a, I mean, finding out different learnings from different registries. So we have registries where we compare ourselves with countries which are developing and uh, for countries, but all the time it uh, leads to an uh, improvement effort. And the final thing is uh, very important, how to convey the results to individual practitioners. So uh, uh, as Dr. Gupta said, uh, very small data set, but also it is important because for example, in uh, surgical side, we found that infection rate is quite variable between services and among practitioners. And we have figured out a way to anonymously convey this uh, data to the individual physicians and hope that it will lead to an improvement. Um, in terms of institution, we are in a phase where we are collecting data. Some of our registry data is very good. 
and there are places where we are challenged. Thank you. Great. Um, once again, I think uh, these these discussions are so fascinating, and we could go on for for a long time. But unfortunately, we do have to keep moving on. Jepta, fantastic talk. On. And I think the takeaway points: one is that we're in Pakistan are still in the early stage of data collection, and I think it's important to invest in quality data collection at this point, and and look to the future and plan for the future for implementation for quality improvement. And the second thing is, I think, sharing the data with the physicians consistently on a quarterly basis, sharing the reports so that they get that feedback um, and, and are able to make uh, some changes based, based on the data. So uh, again, I, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jepta, for an incredible talk. And thank you to our panelists for the very interactive um, session. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Amber Malik now. Uh, who is um, another uh, one of our fantastic colleagues and mentors. Um, and she's going to be um, uh, introducing the next speaker as well as the panel. Over to you, Dr. Amber. Uh, thank you, Sman, um, for uh, always including uh, me in your pulse uh, uh, activities, uh, which you started last year. Um, I, uh, it's, it's been a delightful evening full of uh, conversation and, and, and excellent talks uh, and delightful panels and interactive talks. Uh, it's my great honor uh, to moderate the peripheral intervention uh, uh, session and uh, to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, who is Dr. Carlos Mina Hurtado. Uh, he was uh, delayed, I think, because he was busy in a case. Let me give a, a, a small uh, brief introduction for him. He was born and raised in Colombia. Uh, South America, where he received his MD degree at the University of Antioquia. He later moved to the United States, where he did his postgraduate training at Yale University, including internal medicine, cardiology, and interventional cardiology. He spent a dedicated year in advanced peripheral vascular interventions. He is nationally known as a national uh, uh, PI for several trials, including Latinx ISR trial. He also has participated in many other pivotal uh, PAD trials, including Levant 2, Levant BTK, and many more, and a number of carotid revascularization trials also. His re interests also expand to renal denervation and carotid intervention. And he has multiple publications in peer-reviewed uh, journals, uh, including uh, the uh, New England Journal, JAK, and has lectured around the world on all PAD-related topics. He is currently an associate professor of medicine, co-director of Limb Preservation Program, Honorary Clinical Reader in Center, uh, Clinical Pharmacology in the William Harvey Research Institute. He's co-director, Vascular Outcomes Program, Medical Director, Vascular Medicine, Yale uh, New Haven Hospital, Internal Medicine. We're truly very fortunate to have him here with us, and he will be talking about peripheral interventions from guideline to practice. Before he comes on, I would like uh, uh, to also introduce our panelists, uh, Dr. Suhail Khan, who's here with us uh, from American Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, he's uh, chairman, New Cardiovascular Horizon Salt Lake City. Dr. Faisal Hassan from Cleveland Clinic, associate mm -hmm. clinical professor of medicine. Dr. Fahad Shuja, he's assistant professor of surgery, consultant division of vascular and endovascular surgery, Mayo Clinic. Dr. Ali Farooq Iqbidar, who I met last year as well, uh, assistant professor of medicine, Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, I would now like to uh, uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Carlos uh, Suho, uh, Dr. N, so that he can start his talk on peripheral interventions, guideline to practice. Good morning, US time. Good evening, Pakistan time. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure, Dr. Malik. Your introduction was phenomenal. I'm going to hire you from now on to give, when I go and give lectures around the world. Um, a couple of things I want to mention before I go on with my lecture. Osman is, uh, is exciting to see you, even though it's through the camera. I, I remember all the times when you were here at training with us. So uh, I'm very happy to see that you're doing well. And uh, I see a great friend that I haven't seen in a long time, Dr. Uh, Hassan. See, he's growing a beer. Uh, I think that Abu Dhabi is treating him very nicely. I'm still waiting for my invitation, but we'll see. 
In addition to that, I am uh, I'm going to introduce uh, one of my fellows who actually came from your medical school and trained with you. And as I was preparing this talk, he uh, realized that I was given this. And I said, well, is your medical school, is your country, is your people, let's do it together. So he's going to collaborate with me in the presentation. And he's Dr. Ahmad Arham. Hopefully, I didn't kill the name no, as I presented. That's good. Thank you. Go ahead. So in the next few minutes, we're going to walk you through a few things in terms of peripheral vascular interventions, and hopefully this is provocative enough. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to make relevant as I did this was mostly to uh, make the connection between uh, cardiology and peripheral vascular disease. From the interventional point of view, at least here in the United States, peripheral vascular disease is an area that is somewhat in the middle to a multiple uh, specialties, and at times is good and at times is bad. What I mean by that is uh, multidisciplinary work and collaboration should be one of the main pillars of practicing uh, vascular uh, medicine. Uh, so I'm gonna go and uh, discuss, in terms of disclosure, I am a consultant for the companies listed on the slide. For this particular presentation, I don't think that any of them are applicable. As a way of background, and many of you know this, uh, preferred vascular disease worldwide is a real problem. And it's interesting because uh, disease recognition as well as treatment of these patients is important. Many of them from the cardiology point of view have concomitant uh, coronary and cerebrovascular disease, which is the most common cause of death. 15 to 20% of patients over the age of uh, 70 have uh, PAD in, uh, at any given time in any vascular uh, territory out of those patients that have peripheral vascular disease affecting the lower extremity, about 10% uh, will go on to uh, develop critical ischemia, uh, which is the worst clinical presentation, if you will. Depending upon where you are in the world, patients can present in different ways, whereas in developed countries, perhaps uh, the usual presentation is claudication. In developing countries, on the other hand, like Pakistan, like South America, where I am from, many times the initial presentation is that of CLI. Five to 10% of those patients, however, that present with claudication will then go on and have uh, CLI. So it's a relevant issue. So why did I get into this issue of PAD? Uh, this is an uh, old study, but it's relevant. The numbers haven't changed much. And if you look at the slide, uh, PAD has a huge impact in terms of mortality, the five-year uh, mortality rates as depicted in the slide. You know, when you compare this with other uh, entities, i.e. breast cancer, you know, at least in our culture, uh, if someone has a lump in their breast, within 24 hours, they're getting a mammogram, a biopsy, and a full workup. If you present with a necrotic toe, people don't pay attention. They don't care they don't necessarily understand the significance or relevance of it. But from where we are standing, that necrotic toll uh, has a huge implication uh, from the patient and the health system's point of view. And the beauty of it, if you will, is that to identify these patients, you don't need to do complex, difficult workups, imaging, expensive, for instance, when you are planning a tower, the amount of resources that you have to spend to uh, determine whether the patient needs it or not, and furthermore, what they're going to do is quite complicated. For PAD, just an ABI. If you do an ABI, which you can do it by the bedside in your office, in this slide, I show you the pronostic implications of patients depending upon whether the ABI is normal or abnormal. So important implications. Now, I present this slide to my fellows often to show them uh, that uh, atherosclerotic disease is a systemic illness. And we as cardiovascular specialists are in a prime position to deal with it because the measurements, not only diagnostic, but interventions that we take to treat coronary artery disease are exactly the same for the most part uh, to treat cerebrovascular disease, carotid disease, renal disease, visceral arterial disease, or lower extremity PAD. Uh, but when you focus on this, you realize that the pathophysiology is pretty much similar uh, in, to a large degree when you're talking about 
an SFA that gets occluded versus an LED that goes down. The clinical presentations obviously are different, but in the background, all these phenomena are occurring uh, to the same degree. This is why many of the medications that we use are similar, and this is why PAD is a CAD equivalent. What happens or what's happening in the US, and I think this is a, a global phenomenon as I travel around the world and give lectures and realize and interact with people is that with increased prevalence of diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, uh, people are getting older and surviving. Uh, PAD is on the rise. And if you look at them uh, and stratify them based upon known risk factors, for instance, I chose for the sake of time, one of them, diabetes, clearly, whether you have PAD and associated with or without uh, diabetes, whether you're younger or older, your outcomes are particularly different. So you go from someone who is younger without diabetes to someone who is older with diabetes, the survival is quite different. So we need to start paying attention. In the cardiovascular clinics, when I started the vascular program medicine, uh, the vascular medicine program at Yale many years ago, our fellows would never ask the patients to take their socks off. And uh, that's where we start, going back to the basics. And uh, we were able to achieve that. So this is a significant problem with a huge impact in morbidity and mortality, more importantly, in the quality of life of many patients. As cardiologists, we definitely need to span our horizon beyond the heart and practice uh, in a, co a cohesive way and holistic way as the body is telling us in different territories what the problems are. So how can we start practicing this and what do we need to do? So first, uh, we need to define the problem and I am going to uh, let Ahmad uh, describe uh, or take it from here. Go ahead. Hey, good morning from New Haven. Uh, nice to talk to friends and colleagues and my seniors. So I basically uh, defined with symptoms of claudication and the way you would categorize them. You have uh, patients would be asymptomatic and you can have them do normal treadmill testing. You have mild claudication symptoms will uh, be able to do uh, normal testing. Uh, and when you measure their ankle pressures will be more than 50 millimeters, eight, uh, more than 50 millimeters. Uh, that's grade one, you will category one to three. It, and patients with severe claudic games would be, have pressure of less than 50. Then you have patients who will be moving from the claudic category into critical limb ischemia. It would be those who have rest pain. They'll have resting ankle pressure of less than 40 with flat uh, uh, pulse wave on, uh, recordings. And then you have minor and major tissue loss, uh, which would be categorized as, uh, as uh, stage three. Uh, moving on towards like, you know, how would you look for those patients in your clinic? So you have to have a, a significant patient profile, those with beyond the age of 65 or between the age of 50 to 65 with at least uh, one risk factor, which could be hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, or a positive family history. Even those patients who are less than 50 and diabetic with an additional risk factor or patients who have manifested uh, an atherosclerotic process in a different uh, part of the body. The history would be that of claudication, uh, typical or atypical, or ischemic rest pain. On physical examination would be simple with evaluation of uh, lower extremity pulses. Uh, um, look for signs of uh, dependent rhubarb. Uh, look for vascular bruise or uh, non-healing wounds or gangrene. As uh, Dr. Menas said, um, initial evaluation is very simple. Uh, based on history and physical examination, we go with uh, ankle brachial uh, index testing uh, with abnormal evaluation of less than 0.9 or more than 0.4, which would be non-compressible. Uh, uh, if you do, uh, if you're finding non-compressible vasculature in a patient, you can do further testing, which will be in the form of toe brachial index testing. We can do uh, ABI testing uh, with exercise if patients have a suggestive history, but resting ABIs are within normal limits. Similarly, uh, if a patient uh, has a lower extremity wounds or suggestive of critical limb ischemia with ABI testing, which is within normal limits, you can do uh, further testing, which would uh, include uh, PVRs uh, or skin perfusion testing or transcutaneous uh, pulmonary oxygen testing. So let's suppose you do uh, this evaluation and uh, you have a patient who uh, is likely has uh, peripheral arterial disease, their ABI is uh, 0.8 in both legs, 
but they're asymptomatic. Uh, so what, uh, how, how does that affect you or the patient? So the thing is upon uh, evaluation of a patient like that, it's important to initiate uh, goal-directed medical therapy in terms of lifestyle changes, initiation of exercise, which can impact in the form of reducing uh, ischemic cardiovascular outcomes, improving functional status, look for risk factors, the patient is a smoker, consult them about uh, cessation uh, of smoking. The question comes up about screening uh, for other arterial beds if an atherosclerotic process is found. There's no definite guideline out there uh, for it, um, uh, except that uh, as the US uh, PTF uh, task force has a guideline for the AAA screening uh, for smokers between the age of men uh, for 65 to 75. Now, once you, uh, what kind of medical treatment would you consider initiating for patients who have uh, peripheral arterial disease? You have simple antiviral therapy of aspirin or Plavix for asymptomatic or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, initiation of statin agents, antihypertensive therapy, which would be uh, in the form of um, ACE inhibitor or ARBs. Uh, Silostrazole still has uh, uh, a recommendation of class one for uh, increasing walking distances in patients who have lifestyle limiting claudication. But pentoxicillin like, you know, has a class three recommendation. If the patient is diabetic, aiming for intensive diabetic control is recommended, especially because it can reduce the risk of uh, development of CLI. Uh, having a structured exercise program, especially here in the US, is very like. <laughs> Yeah, we were talking about uh, the structured exercise programs. So that's something which we do, like, you know, uh, emphasize a lot over here in the US. A, a supervised exercise program has been shown to have persistent benefits, improve quality of life, in, in, uh, and uh, improve a walking distance. Uh, it's something which we recommend in claudic and symptoms to be uh, discussed even before initiation of uh, intervention. Uh, in patients who, in which uh, distance may be limited because of uh, claudic and symptoms, even low intensity exercise. Uh, or stationary exercise bikes uh, are recommended and can improve uh, walking ability and functional status. So, but what if the patient has symptomatic uh, peripheral arterial disease? Then you have to categorize whether it's in the form of claudication or uh, critical ischemia. If it's in the form of claudication, the goals are to improve functional status and quality of life. And if it's a lifestyle limiting claudication, uh, revascularization strategy can be considered. But if the patient is presented with critical ischemia, the objectives have changed and you have to be aim to uh, revascularize to minimize tissue loss, uh, completely heal the wound and preserve a functional foot, which can be achieved by having at least one vessel in line of blood flow. That's where the concept of angiosomes and the foot uh, is important, uh, which uh, is basically based on the fact that revascularization in the particular, in the territory where the wound is, leads to uh, the most ideal wound healing. So, uh, in, as to summarize, the, the revascularization guidance for claudication is based on uh, if a patient has lifestyle limiting claudication, which is not responding to uh, exercise regimen or goal directed medical therapy, but for a uh, patient with critical ischemia, it's to minimize tissue loss. And if a, uh, it's recommended to have uh, an interdisciplinary meeting uh, before an amputation is considered uh, for critical ischemia. Then if you're considering revascularization, the options are endovascular and surgical. We are interventional cardiologists. So our main goals are in endovascular uh, strategy, but important to understand like which patients would uh, go best uh, in which category. Not gonna go into more, too much detail for it, uh, but uh, patients with uh, 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 lifestyle limiting claudication for aortoiliac uh, occlusive disease of femoral popliteal can certainly be uh, addressed uh, endovascularly. However, uh, treating infrapopliteal lesions for claudicans is not exact, doesn't carry a very strong indication. Uh, surgical revascularization, uh, if being considered for uh, uh, claudican symptoms, is recommended to consider uh, autogenous vein rather than a prosthetic material. Uh, and uh, surgical revascularization can be considered uh, if, uh, depending on the anatomy uh, or the risk factor of the patient and the technical factors of the procedure. 
Similarly, if the patient presents with critical ischemia, endovascular procedures are important to establish inline flow. Uh, Angiosome-directed endovascular therapy is reasonable to allow for uh, the most optimal wound healing. Uh, for uh, surgical revascularization, again, the autogenous uh, veins to be used for uh, revascularization are ideal, but if not available, uh, prosthetic material can be used. So uh, in something from our side, uh, over here in the US, like uh, the peripheral arterial disease is managed by an interdisciplinary team, which does not just include like one specialty of uh, interventional cardiology or vascular surgery or interventional radiology. It involves the whole process of nurses. We have internal medicine people, wound care, ID to guide, guide us about uh, the appropriate antibiotics, radiology to follow up on imaging uh, and physical and occupational therapists as well. So we have a few uh, cases that we can show you. I will highlight uh, that, you know, the guidelines are guidelines and clinical practice is affected by uh, everyone's environment. So the U.S. guidelines are a good step forward, but obviously uh, what is being done around the world will be impacted by the, your own resources, your patient's presentation. And as I highlighted earlier in my talk, uh, the patient's presentations are very heterogeneous depending upon what you're looking for. The typical cases that we get, uh, we get all sorts of patients from uh, visceral cases, uh, carotid interventions with uh, narrow rescue, lower extremity. So we'll show you a few cases and then we can open it up for discussion uh, with a wonderful panel that we have. This is a typical patient with renal artery stenosis. The indications behind it, as you will know, have changed over uh, the years from being a very common uh, procedure to have very limited indications. In this case, we have a lady uh, with uh, unilateral real artery stenosis uh, with a contralateral atrophic kidney. Uh, hopefully the films play well. And basically the left kidney is gone and in the right there is a high grade severe uh, stenosis. Percutaneous therapy can be given and in this case with adequate resolution of what I, uh, was described as resistant hypertension. Uh, another case, this is a case uh, that was referred to us of a patient who had uh, coronary artery disease with a prior uh, bypass, hypertension, hyperlipidemia with a uh, new drop in the left ventricular ejection fraction uh, and CHF exacerbation. The interesting part of it is that when the, they did everything, it turns out that the main source of uh, the drop in the ejection fraction was the anterior wall for non-schemic evaluation. And here's a perfect example from the cardiology point of view where we can play a role and contribute by fixing this tight lesion. We were able to fix the inflow to the IMA graph, which uh, resulted in improvement in the patient's uh, left ventricular ejection fraction and symptomatology. So, these are areas in which we can definitely play a role and I can go on showing more cases uh, in terms of lower extremity carotids, et cetera, et cetera. But from the percutaneous point of view, I think that having a well-trained endovascular specialist is critical for the development of a comprehensive uh, cardiovascular program. Now, we are interventional cardiologists, but this can also be accomplished by other specialties. And this is why I highlight, you need to be as collaborative as possible, and this should be done in the context, uh, ideally, of a multidisciplinary group. So with this, I finish. We finish. Um, this is wonderful, Osman, and uh, you guys are putting this lecture together. It's my first time. I uh, love to do it uh, live. Uh, obviously, now is not the time, but look forward to next year. Maybe that will be an opportunity. So I'll give it back to you guys, Dr. Malik. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Carlos Mina. Uh, that was a great lecture put together uh, by your uh, uh, fellow and yourself uh, and, and a nice uh, uh, couple of cases. Uh, we would have enjoyed some more peripheral uh, uh, lower limb cases as well and uh, uh, wanted to uh, have a look at those as well. Uh, I would like to open up the uh, panel for discussion uh, first by comments or any questions from uh, the panel, uh, if they have any. Um, Dr. Sohail Khan. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Amber, for uh, for putting this together. Usman, of course, thanks for the invite. Uh, Carlos and Amber, there's a great talk. As they say that uh, 
unhealthy leg or the leg with wounds is never attached to the healthy body. So these patients, they don't die of the leg wound, they die of heart attacks and stroke. And that's why it's so important uh, you know, as a cardiologist to make sure they are on good medical therapy, as you know, Carlos mentioned, aspirin to decrease the risk of strokes uh, or MIs and you know, statins as well. Um, so my, my question is more like, you know, uh, uh, a little uh, kind of uh, practical, like, you know, standpoint is, is um, the, the Achilles heel of any vascular intervention, whether it's like coronary or in the PAD, is pre stenosis. And, and we know the, the drug eluting stents in 2002, when they burst onto the scene in 2002 and 2004, it changed the field of interventional cardiology as we know it. And the primary benefit was decreased risk of restenosis. And we are running into the same issue in the, in the PAD. Um, uh, we had drug-coated balloons and stents, but we had that meta-analysis in 2018 where there were some mortality signals at four to five years. But subsequent studies, uh, you know, there's a recent uh, uh, paper which was published in NAGM. It's called the SWIFT study. It's a study out of like, you know, Sweden. But there's no mortality benefit. So, and, I, and then these patients are so sick and you put the bare metal stand or just do a you know regular balloon angioplasty they keep coming back every six months eight months so what are your thought the panel thought on the use of drug coated balloon and stand in the PAD patients and this question is for Carlos and I'm sure Dr. Pashuja at Mayo Clinic is also working on it are you guys using it or not so I'll give you my take on it and I'll be curious to hear what others said. We did also publish our experience and we did not find any uh, mortality signal in the use of paclitaxel. So I agree with you, re-stenosis is the Achilles tendon as well uh, of endovascular intervention. But that's one of the reasons why uh, several things. One, you need to look at the patient as a whole and determine whether endo versus bypass uh, is the better approach. Not because we can do it, we should do it. And we're in the midst of presenting or collecting the final data for best CLI, which will be useful to understand in terms of surgical versus endo as an initial approach of patients with CLI. Second, there are so many endo devices available for lower extremity intervention. And I think that each one of us need to develop a algorithms as to how to use each one of them. There is a place for atherectomy, there is a place for bare metal stents, there is a place for drug gluten stents, cover stents, and so forth and so on. I personally think that the drug gluten technology as it stands right now is extremely useful for this type of patients. The litigious nature of uh, medicine in the US uh, makes us protect ourselves and we disclose to the patients the possibility of using those devices and the potential risk uh, as the FDI, FDA has asked us to do. But we use them routinely. We have not changed our uh, practice. Uh, but I don't think that they necessarily are, are the solution to the issue of re -estenosis. There's extensive research doing uh, new devices like bioabsorbable scaffolds and so forth and so on. And I think that we don't have the perfect solution. Unlike in the coronary, in peripheral vascular disease, I think the drug technology has made a big impact, but not as big as it was in the coronary territory. So that's my thought. I don't, I'm curious to see what others think. Um, so this is uh, Faisal. Um, so Hale, very nice point uh, that you brought up about this, um, you know, issue with paclitaxel in the peripheral uh, arteries. And I think um, um, Carlos's uh, comments are very well taken. Um, first of all, Carlos, really good to see you. Uh, and it's good to see that uh, that we left a legacy at Yale. So so people from Aga Khan are still making it in, uh, and and hopefully leaving a good impression. Um, so, um, so hello to you. I don't know about that. That's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, re really good to see you. And, and the invitation is definitely forthcoming. Um, uh, so uh, I think that this whole debate of uh, paclitaxel was very interesting, uh, but it also uh, goes to show that uh, we have to evaluate data very carefully. And and uh, the group that started this, uh, this entire um, sort of... Um, controversy was this Greek group that, that published their data in, uh, you know, maybe two, two and a half years ago. Um, and if you look at the data, it's a meta-analysis of, of a bunch of very di disparate studies. Um, makes no sense to put it all together. 
uh, and multiple biases in that study. But unfortunately, what it led to was a state of panic, uh, which I think we also saw in the coronary arena when some data regarding drug eluding stents came out in, uh, you know, right around when I was coming out of fellowship. Um, so I think we have to be careful at looking at this data because subsequent analyses, including the New England Journal article, very clearly demonstrate that there is no mortality signal and we can safely use these devices. But I think a question, um, Carlos, to you, and also potentially to the other um, colleagues on this panel, is that um, you know we we have all these technologies. We've kind of you know used them here and there. Um, there's really not no not much data. You know, atherectomy, for example. You know, I was a big user back when I was a fellow and then a junior faculty member. Absolutely no data to support um, you know any kind of improved outcomes. Uh, but we know that it's a tool to achieve success in certain situations, but that's pretty much as, as far as it goes. Where, where do you see our field evolving? You know, what is the bigger picture? You know, I feel like we're stuck. Um, Carlos, you know, when, when we came out of fellowship, we had all these technologies, drug coated balloons were new. We were looking at scaffolds. We were really excited about it. And I think that that was a very um, exciting time for, for our field. Uh, but I feel that, you know, as far as devices go, we have kind of, you know, we, we haven't made much progress in the past, you know, six, seven, eight years, uh, which is very unusual. There's a bunch of devices. So do you think that we need to approach this slightly differently? Do you think that we need to look at it more from a bigger picture view rather than um, stents and balloons? And, you know, do we need to sort of... Um, uh, see what, what else we can do. Do we need better data? You know, what 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 do what do colleagues think? You know, how can we make our field uh, progress? Because I, I truly feel that we are we are kind of stuck in a place and haven't moved much in the past many years. So, Basil, your comments are right on, uh, and I wish you were still here working with us, and you would see uh, how much we have changed our approach to this. Um, I'll give you a few examples. A hundred percent agree with you device research, although it has dominated the space, I personally think is useless in the sense that opening an SFA does nothing for a patient. If you are unable to control the risk factors and treat them adequately with a guideline directed therapy. We just did a, a paper that is coming out in Jack in the next few weeks in which we took a VQI. VQI is a national registry for vascular interventions, both endo and open. And I asked the question of how was guideline directed medical therapy was used prior and after intervention? Meaning if you go for an SFA stent, how many of those patients were inadequate, inadequate medical therapy? And we define adequate medical therapy as the utilization of aspirin, simple, the utilization of statin, simple, and the utilization of an ACE uh, inhibitor or ARB if appropriate. So we use the American ACCAHA guidelines. And what we found, Fasel, was that out of the entire cohort of people, and there were thousands of people, so about 500 of them, out of those, only 30% of the patients were in guideline-directed medical therapy. And what it was more shocking is that after the intervention, there was only a single digit increase in the utilization of medical therapy, including aspirin. So about 60% of the patients after intervention were not in one of these different guideline directed medical therapy. That is crazy. So opening the SFA in someone who you haven't addressed this makes no difference, makes no sense. So I 100% agree. How can we make our specialty and our field better is looking at the big picture. The big picture is how do we improve patients' access to care? How do we improve the utilization of adequate medical therapy? What are the barriers to use uh, medical therapy? Another important aspect that has not been done and that we're actively looking at it is patient-centered outcomes. It doesn't matter to me what I wanna do for the patient, but if the patient comes with claudication, what does the patient really want to get out of my intervention? Because what they want is just to improve their cardiovascular risk. The objectives are different. So that's how I think in our new concert that how we are going to uh, improve the gap that exists. I think device intervention is important, is useful for certain specific patients, but 
the usual standard approach in the US where someone comes with vascular disease and the whole idea is either to give them a stent or a bypass has to be rethought. I would uh, second that, uh, uh, that thought process. Really, I think uh, we have to not just see us, ourselves as endovascular or surgical specialists for revascularization purposes, but really, I think vascular medicine has played a critical role in, uh, in uh, a lot of the outcomes that we really deeply care about. And I would push back a little bit. I think uh, we are making headway. Uh, it is going to take uh, time uh, with proliferation of the technology, but also increased proliferation of the uh, medical therapy component, uh, because there are data which shows that we have uh, nationally and here in Indiana, we, we have uh, data that we have improved amputation rate more than 25 to 30 uh, percent compared to 20 years ago. So these are on a global scale having an impact. So I wouldn't say that uh, uh, now I think specific devices and whether we use drug eluding versus atherectomy, I think that perhaps is important for the individual patient. But I think on a global level, uh, increasing community access uh, for uh, vascular specialists and endovascular therapies has definitely made a difference. <clears throat> and I think perhaps one of the uh, uh, pushes needs to be to now push it out more and more uh, to beyond tertiary centers into outpatient settings where we have uh, increased access for vascular specialists, whether they are radiologists, cardiologists, or vascular surgeons. <clears throat> One question that I had for you, Dr. Menia, um, which is a slight difference, uh, a slight change is, so, and perhaps this is a much larger discussion, but it is a contested space and uh, we leave it to the individual uh, physician to make a judgment call of endovascular versus surgical uh, approach. Is there, an, uh, is there, has there been a push or a, uh, 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 an approach to developing a common institutional platform for evaluating these patients and then determining which way you would go, whether surgical versus <clears throat> endovascular, as we've done in the cardiac space with the heart, heart uh, team approach. Well, you know, I think that the answer to that is uh, in some places, yes, in many places, no. I think that it would be critical to the success of uh, any uh, vascular medicine program. And I want to use vascular medicine in a way to encompass both open and endo interventions as it comes to revascularization, is to have both a specialty. But the construct is very difficult and very challenging. Uh, Fasil, if you remember when we were here together, you know, we were at war with vascular surgery and it was a turf war as to who got to do the procedures. In our current era, uh, we've come to realize that working together, we are stronger than working in isolation. But in order to do that, we had to change the financial construct that existed between specialties. If you don't change, you see, the practice environment will influence how all these different specialties relate together. And it requires a big leadership change and understanding of what the issues are. Just saying, you guys gotta see the patients together, that is not enough because at stake, there are many different issues. And if you don't recognize them and appropriately address them, it's never gonna work. So here it took us a long time to understand what the real issues were that would allow us to actually sit on a table and see the patient. There are the issues of billing, there is the issues of reimbursement, there is the issues of your own salary. And it's sad to say that that gets in the way of treating patients, but it's the reality. Once you get rid of all those barriers and you get to the point of actually being a doctor, it works like a charm. You have a surgeon, you have a cardiologist in this case, and you can offer a pre-op evaluation in one, at the same appointment. You can offer your uh, ideas in terms of uh, percutaneous vascularization and have a conversation as to what is the best way to do it. And when we do it that way is when we get the best outcomes and the best results but you need to be able to navigate all these different issues. Uh, and I think that we've become very successful here now, but it took us a long time to understand and figure that out. And many different health systems will be at a different point during this uh, journey. 
Carlos, those are those are fantastic points. Um, you know, and I I want to echo those. Um, you know, I think we have huge lessons to learn uh, from our colleagues who uh, participate in structural heart interventions. Um, I think if you want to look at a group of people who got it right, um, we've got to look at the people who who took TAVR uh, to the next level. Right from the very beginning, I think they understood the complexities, they understood the competition, they understood that it has to be done in a collaborative way, and they implemented that, um, not only practically, but in their registries and, and in the reimbursement, uh, and you can see the success of it. it. It has grown successfully, it has grown in a controlled fashion, um, as opposed to our field, which I believe kind of got completely out of hand and uncontrolled and um, gave all of us, including uh, those of us, which is pretty much all of us, uh, who wanted to sincerely treat our patients. It, it gave a lot of, uh, of, of physicians a bad name. So um, treatment of peripheral vascular disease got um, a negative um, connotation to it. And, and I think we all have to take responsibility for it. And, and that was the reason why I brought up this point, because I think we have to think forward and see how we can move ahead from, from this area where, where we are stuck. Um, I just wanted to give you a very brief example. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I know that uh, Osman is raising his hand. Um, but you know, we, when we created the, the vascular program at, um, at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, we removed the terms surgery or medicine from it. And we said, this is a vascular program. Uh, you can be a surgeon, you can be a vascular interventionalist, you can be a wound care specialist, you can be a podiatrist. It all comes under the umbrella of having a vascular program. And uh, by doing so, not, on, not the Cleveland Clinic, the way the model is, there's no financial incentive. So that's already not there. But there's two things that come in our way. One is finances, the other is ego. So once you remove um, the finances not being there, uh, programs like Yale don't, don't have a whole lot of it either. And once you remove ego from it and, and truly look at it from a programmatic standpoint, I think that that at least partially um, uh, fixes some of the problems that we are faced with in our field. I think uh, if, if I can come in here from a very Pakistani perspective, uh, this is a, a you know, the, it, it's very, uh, uh, we are in a beginning of uh, development of this phase. I've been working in this field for the more than 10 years or maybe even more than that. But our struggles are very different, <laughs> you know, uh, because we're trying to develop this field. It's, it's, there's a huge uh, 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 patient base around which our physicians are failing to recognize and refer to us at least. So we see the extreme end of the spectrum, which is CLI, wound infections, acute limb ischemia. And really we, don't, we see a lot of atherosclerosis because of aging uh, population as well here lots of smoker, lots of diabetes, but we also see a lot of acute limb ischemia, which has been mismanaged. Essentially, hearts were not managed well, antithrombotic therapy wasn't given, and we come up with acute limb ischemia. And, and then we have all this uh, struggle for patients to understand where to go with their bad legs. They land with orthopedics, they land with neurosurgeons, they land with general surgeons. General surgeons tend to cut off their legs uh, without checking for ischemic limbs. And even I, I recently somebody cut off a gangrenous leg, which was fine, a dialysis patient, uh, and with uh, um, and eventually post operatively, I was asked to see. We had a huge uh, has had recent MI with multiple clots in the left ventricle. Essentially, that's where it was coming from, and the patient might well have gone home without any anticoagulation or anything. So there, there's a and then there is a whole struggle again with uh, uh, with who's going to see, uh, treat these patients, uh, who's the vascular surgeon, interventional radiologists, interventional cardiologists. Cardiologists today are now beginning to take an interest. Institutes are now developing this. So, uh, so, so, so really a very different struggle uh, uh, of uh, how to treat uh, peripheral uh, vascular disease. And I think I, I would put it to Dr. Carlos Mena that what do we do about all these patients that I see who come in badly treated with a bad leg, almost uh, gangrenous, some li viable limb. When, and when you go in to have a look at them, they're three weeks, four weeks, acute limb ischemia, but now they have a, a thrombus somewhere. So, uh, uh, and, and how do you treat that thrombus? 
Yeah, how, you know, one of the first uh, commentators, uh, Dr. Khan, I believe, brought the issue up of people with peripheral vascular disease don't die of the leg. So the leg is an issue, is an important issue. But I think that you brought up a much important problem, which is you need to take of, uh, care of their heart and their brain. That's what they die from. That's what send them to uh, nursing homes. And I don't know how that works in Pakistan, but that's the issue. We cardiologists are in the perfect position to be the leading uh, specialty, uh, taking a role in the management of these patients. We understand what the issues are. We understand what the medication regimens are and what the uh, adverse events of all these different medications. So how I see it is that it's not about a procedure. You ha we have to put that aside. <laughs> be looking at the patient as a whole, be a doctor, treat them in a comprehensive fashion and give them the appropriate management. In terms of LB clot and distal embolization, of course is an issue. Uh, but it all depends, right? Uh, what the clinical scenario is. I think that Fasel uh, is making great points about where do we need to go as a specialty. And I think that we need to continue moving the field forward. Uh, but cardiology is poised to be in the center of it, I think. I completely agree. Amber, well, just, a, just a comment. I mean, this is uh, something that I see very commonly in, in Pakistan and, you know, for some part in the U.S. as well, that, you know, somehow people think that I do PAD and people will just know that I do PAD and they will send, my, uh, send their patients to me. Uh, I think uh, we have to go and teach people. We have to do lunch meetings. We have to do dinner meetings. We have to do this every month, some sort of a conference or a journal club where we can invite PCPs and journal cardiologists. So this is not easy. I've done that for five, six years. I can tell you that this is not easy. It is a struggle. Uh, it is a constant learning and teaching. So that's something that we all need to do. People yeah. don't know about yeah. it. We, 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 uh, everybody's working on it, uh, I think. And still, still there's a long way to go. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, can we take some uh, comments from you and then we can wind up because I can see Usman getting very jittery here. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I can't hide sweat. I can't hide sweat on my forehead, unfortunately. <laughs> no, I was just trying to uh, stick to the time. Um, I think uh, very, very good talk and, and I think very important points raised. I think uh, my thoughts are the same. I actually think PAD is in a very exciting phase of its of its uh, lifespan. Uh, one of the things that the past 10 years have shown to us is that we got to think about the lesion that we are treating. And one of, one of the fundamental reasons why there are so many newer products coming out every few years is that there's no one size fits all. And somebody tries to tackle PAD with uh, mechanical debulking, and then they find out, well, there's only 60% of the times that it will work or 70%. There's still one third of the PAD population that don't really benefit or don't really need it. So I think moving forward where I see the future is, yes, there's going to be a, a more, uh, more acceptance that this is a multi-specialty condition. Uh, there's no one physician who can treat it all. There's no one specialty who can treat it all. And there is no one product that can treat it all. I think Paclitaxel is just the first one of a series of products that's gonna come out. I think 10 years from now, we will see three, four, five different drugs. There's gonna be stem cells. Uh, we have, um, we are currently actually studying uh, Limus-based products and uh, uh, stem cells. Um, we're gonna find better ways to get the drugs or the cells to, to the specific target. Uh, we know from all the different physiological study that 40% uh, of the product is actually washed off the moment you finish your treatment, especially if this is a DCB platform. So I think, uh, you know, there is, there, is, there is plenty of food for thought. As long as we all talk to each other, I can't stress enough the fact that money has to be a secondary factor. As long as we're going to have a a practice model where your number of procedures or the number of products that you instill in a patient are going to be directly tied up to your, to your salary, I think subconsciously we're all going to be guilty of not necessarily putting the patient first. It, 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 sh it should all come down to, you know, what does the patient need the best? And I think 20, 25 years from now, we will all be sophisticated enough that 
we will say, okay, we have a 70 year old guy with uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, has a 50 centimeter long SFA lesion, which is heavily calcified with a lot of thrombus and a single vessel uh, runoff. This guy is better treated with treatment A, or we have a 55 year old guy with no diabetes, well-controlled hypertension, has a 20 centimeter minimally calcified, mildly thrombotic, mid SFA uh, problem, better treated with treatment B. So I think that's where the future is, better defining our patient cohorts for all of these fascinating treatments. I think they all have their pros and cons. We just haven't done a good job at defining the patients who will benefit from each and every one of them. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Shuja. And uh, before we wind up, I think it's been an excellent discussion. There are two questions from the audience and if Usman allows me to ask them uh, from the panel or from Dr. Minna. Uh, Absolutely, then... and I have a comment as well, Dr. Malik. Okay, sure. So can I ask the questions? Yeah, go ahead with the questions and, and I'll... Just finish with your comment then. Uh, uh, for patients, uh, so the question is from the audience, fellow interventional cardiology from AKU. For patients who have a gangrenous limb being prepared for below knee, knee amputation, do you think that angioplasty would improve post-surgical wound healing? And should lower limb angio and angioplasty be routinely performed in patients who have a gangrenous lower limb? Dr. Carlos, somebody want to take it? Sure, I can take it. Um, I think uh, so. So I will try to keep it keep it brief. Although I will say that there is there is a whole pathway uh, that goes into uh, working up a patient with a uh, foot <coughs> that is that has already developed uh, gangrene. Um, you know. First is you have to determine the level that you're going to perform the uh, foot amputation. Are you talking about a toe amputation, a transmetatarsal amputation, which is a forefoot amputation, or are you going to go with a more major amputation like a below the knee amputation? So uh, that's the first order of business. Uh, then you have to have a physiological assessment of what is the perfusion of the leg in all those various uh, sites, you know, so if you're just looking for a toe amputation, if the gangrene is limited to the toe, then you just basically need a, you know, a high enough perfusion to the bottom of the, of your, of your toe amputation site to heal your surgical incision. Uh, we can go on about what are the different ways of uh, measuring the level of perfusion. The bottom line is that some people will uh, use TCPO2s, some people will use tobacchial indices, uh, but some measure of pedal perfusion is, is going to be paramount. And if the perfusion is good enough, normally we will take a TCPO2 of more than 40 as a sign that you have enough oxygenation to heal a four foot amputation or a toe amputation. Uh, then you don't need to uh, necessarily do any kind of uh, complex vascular uh, reinterventions, but if the level of oxygenation is low, it means that there is a sufficient flow, uh, flow uh, limiting lesion proximally, and then you go down the whole slew of you know finding out where that where that uh, where that lesion is and what can you do about it. Thank you. And uh, the the next question is there uh, from the audience to the panel, is there an algorithm for non-invasive assessment for renal artery stenosis, or should we have low threshold for invasive angio? Well, renal artery stenosis is a complex topic and it will take us a whole hour to go through it. But in general, if you look for it, you'll find it. The question is whether you should treat it or not. And I think that that is the main issue. Uh, the data and the different trials that have come out favor revascularization in a very small subset of patients, those with severe bilateral renal artery stenosis that have resistant hypertension defined as those that are in at least three medications, one of which is a diuretic, or those that have a single, uh, renal, single kidney with renal artery stenosis. In our practice, that's basically the main reasons to revascularize. Other than that is medical therapy and identify uh, the reasons behind patients' adherence to the medication regimen. That's how we're practicing uh, currently. I don't know if the other panelists have a comment about it. I think we take a comment from Usman. 
as our last. Yeah, I think I think an awesome session again. Um, so this, uh, you know, this uh, the Pakistani perspective is is very valid, as Dr. Amber said. However, the principles of increasing recognition and referral are the same as what what have been successful in the U.S. I think you know I work at a hospital that's the busiest tertiary care hospital, multi-specialty in a city of 20 million people. And maybe there's five, maybe 10 people in the entire city that are well-trained to do peripheral vascular interventions. So we should be doing PV all day long, 24 seven, right? But we're not, the, you know, the case volumes are still low because the referral is just not there. So I think the principle of reaching out to podiatrists, family medicine doctors, general practitioners, general surgeons, and educating them is key. I think the devices are important because there are days when I've been stuck with a case where I wished I had, you know, the crosser or, or, or some of the other devices, the lasers, that, the tools that are there, because you certainly need them from a case-to-case -case basis, um, although the data is lacking. Um, and interestingly, the most successful model that I've seen in our city in Karachi that works came from the endocrinologists. There's a charity hospital of endocrinologists. That's uh, one of the, probably one of the busiest endocrinology hospitals in, in the world. And they got a WhatsApp group. And I think Carlos, I, I hope you know what WhatsApp is and you use it because it's, it's transformative in the delivery of healthcare in Pakistan. And so there's five or six of us on this and you know they'll send us a picture of a patient's foot and now they can do just diagnostic angios and angio and ask us for our opinion and be like, okay, this is what you need. Send the patient over. Work on the, you know, use the same group to work on the patient's finances and and use that same group to figure out where a certain balloon is or a certain stent is. So the disease is, uh, I think, you know, the the meaning of the word pandemic has changed in 2020, but I think it's truly almost, you know, it's it's epidemic proportions. In Pakistan, the first step is primary prevention, good medical therapy, and risk factor modification. But we do need high quality intervention and access to the tools that hopefully will be coming down the pike and coordination between uh, vascular surgeons and, and cardiologists. I think with those uh, very good words, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Carlos Mina for an excellent uh, talk. Uh, and, and all our panelists for their very nice comments and uh, Usman for the great wind up, uh, particularly with the Pakistani perspective. Thank you very much. And then I'll hand over to the next session. Thank you for having us, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So actually, I think this wraps up our session for today. And so I'd like to thank all the presenters, the moderators, the panelists for taking time out. It's Sunday, it's Saturday morning for, for some and, and Saturday evening for others. And it's precious time work-wise or family-wise, so we appreciate it. I think great talks, great interaction today. We ran over, but that's, I think, a sign of the robust discussion that we were generating. So that's good. Thank you again. Thank you. Everyone. And take care. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. Take care. Thank you.